you know the rules. The first rule is one, one fool at, at a time. time. All together now. Usually, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the person I'm holding the microphone is the uh, speaker, and everybody else is sort of listening rather than talking. Frank. <laughs> okay. uh, good. So, well, that is our, Bible. our main speaker for the evening. Yes. This is an evening of solutions. solutions. And uh, he has a stack of books there uh, that probably have a bunch of solutions in that. At any rate, uh, he will tell us about all the news that's been censored and uh, what he has done to research and find out uh, what the real truth is that we are missing. Okay. Without any further ado, Andy Linson P. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to take a poll of the audience before we get started tonight. Uh, because uh, throughout the subjects we're going to be talking about, you know, many people with, uh, on different subjects, uh, some people will accept it as being something they know about. Other people will say, well, that can't be true because I never heard about it. So the one, uh, I got a couple questions for the audience. Let's have a show of hands here. Who thinks, um, who, who basically is comfortable with the idea that our politicians would never lie to us about anything? <laughs> Should we rephrase that? Have a show of hands. Uh, in your lifetime, have you ever experienced a case where you knew uh, a story in the news was lies or was false? That somebody was lying to us? <laughs> Okay, uh, the second question is, um, do you think there's ever any cases where officials from the pharmaceutical industry that manufacture prescription drugs, are there any cases where they would, uh, they would market a drug and maybe not tell us about bad side effects because it would cut into their profits? Does anybody think that the drug companies would never lie to us? Uh, so we, uh, this crowd is pretty familiar with the concept that big companies are putting out misinformation on certain kinds of things. Well, that's what our talk is going to be about tonight. It's, it's called an evening of solutions. And uh, the, all of you have the, the college write up, I assume. The, the four, four main categories we're going to talk about are the military industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industry, the educational industrial complex, from uh, you know, high school on, especially up into college, and the credit hour scams that are being run on the American population, and uh, the chemical industry. When I say chemical industry, we talk about uh, chemicals and uh, the oil and gas industry, how they pollute the air, water, and ground. But uh, there's massive solutions to all four in these industries. Uh, other countries are showing us the way. There's a, a revolution going on. This book came out. It's called The Third Industrial Revolution. And uh, on the back page, there's a flyer up here. Hey, Gary. Yeah. Would you want to uh, hand out one of these flyers, everybody? Please. Oh. Oh, I want some flyers. See if, uh, if, if there's an up there. Yeah. Oh, Here's a few more. See if you can run out. Oh, yeah. That's too much work. On the back of that flyer, 
there's a thing called uh, the five pillars of the third industrial revolution. And uh, those five things are being implemented in various countries around the world right now. It's been going on for the last decade or so with virtually no coverage in the United States. So he went to the doc and uh, Gary and everyone. Take a quick look at that. And uh, the, the core the core of tonight's talk centers around the third industrial revolution that's going on is uh, spelled out by this book by Jeremy Rifkin. It just came out about six weeks ago. And uh, they talk about, well, you know, how fast global warming is happening and uh, what the solutions are. Throughout the night, I'm going to be referring to uh, basically uh, stories that are covered around the world but blacked out in America by the coordinated blackouts of the press. You can find out about uh, blackouts every year with the current edition. These two, Censor 2011 and 2012, are both currently available you know, through Amazon, Warren, Barnes & Noble, any stores that are open. These are nationwide bestsellers, and I have never seen a single book review in the Chicago Sun-Times, Tribune. The reader doesn't even talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, as far as the press is concerned, this pr prestigious journalism project from Sonoma State University just doesn't exist. And the reason it doesn't exist in the media is because the students and their uh, researchers, they sort through about 600 stories from around this country every year, and they call it down to the top 25 most explosive blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. And some of you may have attended my speeches in the past where we uh, talked about the top 10 blacked out subjects. For anybody that wants one, uh, I reprinted on this blue flyer. This is the top 10 blacked out subjects of 1997. 15 years ago, the database was solid on each one of these things. Only one of them on here is beginning to get any kind of media coverage at all, and that's uh, the wealth transfer to the rich, uh, the, the concept that uh, America is being converted into a society with uh, one-tenth of one percent of the people super rich and a massive number of poor people. The middle class is being wiped out. That's where we are. Uh, in America today, there's a tremendous war going on. Um, all we hear is about the war, the so-called war in Iraq and Afghanistan, which uh, those are not really wars. Those are occupations, but the real war is an economic war on the middle class of the American people. And there's all kinds of solutions to that uh, if we wake up. The, uh, in uh, this Censor News, this 2011 edition of Censor News, incidentally, is being censored by the left-wing press and Democracy Now! and all the others. Uh, progressive websites on the internet, many of them won't even mention or talk about this because there's a whole section in this book on the reality of what happened on 9-11, and that's still a taboo subject in America. So uh, we've done talk about that in other nights. But there's, George Orwell was famous for one of his quotes. He said, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Well, that's where we are today. We're, we're living in a time of universal deceit. Uh, Americans generally and well-educated professional people are maintained in a bubble of mythological ignorance on certain subjects that are commonplace knowledge around the world. Uh, we listed four categories. You know, before I get into those four categories briefly, but let me just give you some a uh, handful of anniversary dates where things were uh, recorded, covered in books and things. Uh, things happened, but the press. Oh, excuse me. Just a it's for me. I can't deal with that now. Um, sorry. <sighs> Thank you. 
where we are as a nation has been shaped over since since about 1963 when John F. Kennedy was murdered and the nation was moved in a different direction than what it was heading. We had big uh, industrial, you know, the military industrial complex is one of them, but the pharmaceutical industry has grown into a, a giant money-making machine. In 1967, to give you an example, the, the best minds in the nuclear power industry thought that with a thousand reactors running on American soil by the year 2000, <coughs> uh, one, one accident per thousand years of service what they thought was a, a good record. And somebody asked them, he said, well, what does that mean, one per thousand years of reactor service? And the, the man from the Atomic Energy Commission said, well, in the year 2000, 33 years from now, we're going to be overpopulated enough that the American public is just going to have to get used to one blast a year and a few thousand dead in exchange for cheap electricity. One Chernobyl per year on American soil was the acceptable game plan of the people that gave us the nuclear power industry. Think about that for a minute. The media didn't cover it. If they did, we wouldn't have a nuclear power industry. 1975, the nuclear emergency search team was conducting a quiet, uh, clandestine hunt on Union Oil property in Los Angeles, hunting for a terrorist nuclear bomb, like a suitcase nuke. It turned out to be a hoax, but the, the, the government stance from then up until today is, don't tell the American people that we have a team that responds to terrorist nuclear bomb threats until the day we can't find one and we lose a city. When some city, American city, becomes the third city after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, then we'll admit there's a problem with nuclear power because that's where the bomb material comes from. Again, if the public knew about these kind of things, we wouldn't have a nuclear power industry. 1979, we had Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island incidentally happened two years after the Saskatchewan Conservation House was built in Canada. <coughs> 1977, uh, the knowledge came out of Canada that you could build houses anywhere from Canada on down to the equator, Florida, Texas, everywhere in between. Houses without furnaces that would heat for $10 a month. Furnaces, and, and, and like the furnace we have here, these, these kinds of uh, appliances that use large amounts of energy to provide indoor comfort. They've been obsolete since 1977, but the American public doesn't know about it because of the coordinated news blackouts that are spelled out by Project Censor. Incidentally, the 2012 edition again of Project Censor is the 35th year that project has been up and running. And you can talk to uh, journalism students or uh, people in the, in the journalism industry, newspaper reporters, many of them will tell you they've never heard of Project Censor. <coughs> That, that's how seamless and coordinated the blackout is on this prestigious journalism project. So, you know, we, we've been living, uh, we're, we're in a silent war. The, the right-wing billionaires who own and control our media have waged a, a quiet war on us for the last four years. So we grow up uh, believing things that aren't true. We, uh, a sizable segment of the public still believes that Lee Harvey Oswald killed John Kennedy when all the investigative reports and people that investigated the, the ballistics and everything else, they knew a few years after that uh, that it was, it was done by somebody else, that Lee Harvey Oswald was the patsy. But yet, that, still, that myth is still promoted in America. In, in 1980, in 1980, this book was published, 32 years ago. It's called Energy and War, Breaking the Nuclear Link. And this is where the, Amory Lovins and his partner, Hunter Lovins, uh, husband and wife team that founded Rocky Mountain Institute, they wrote, this little book describes how the nuclear power industry is related to the nuclear weapons industry. And that if you shut down nuclear power and replaced it with something that was more economical, you would get rid of the whole supply line of uh, uranium mines, milling, uh, uranium processing equipment, Geiger counters, everything, machine milling equipment th that you need to build nuclear weapons. If you didn't have nuclear power, then if people were ordering that equipment from suppliers, you would know a country is uh, trying to make an atomic weapon. 
um, but they um, they talked about proliferation and how we we've reached the point we've reached the point where all of with a miniaturization like what we've seen in computers, laptops, cameras, that camera that's filming us tonight, that kind of quality of a portable camera used to be something that weighed 40 or 50 pounds a little while ago, and a battery pack that weighed 30 pounds. Now they're lightweight, portable, people are carrying cell phone cameras. Well, the, the 12,000 pound bulk of a bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, that blast power had been condensed down by, by 1975, a Hiroshima weapon that blast power by 12 kilotons was condensed down into something the size of a football that you would carry around in a purse. And so they wrote, in 1980, they said, you know, a Hiroshima weapon is the size of a football. A thermonuclear weapon that contains all the explosive power of all the bombs dropped in World War II, that kind of explosive power now comes in a canister that you can fit under your bed. And the worldwide public is not aware that these, this is where we are, heading toward a, a technological apocalypse once this kind of equipment and machinery finally becomes available to crazy people or insane people. The human race has always produced a handful of crazies. And unless you can weed out, prevent the birth of crazy people, which we don't have any uh, inkling of how to do yet, then you have to shut down the industries that would make, you know, uh, materials, weapons of mass destruction available to crazies. But they said, they listed all the, the problems leading up to proliferation in the war with the Soviets, and they said, you know, the, the only question, you know, there's no, any, well, no, no longer any question we shall all blow ourselves up. The only question is when. And then you turn the page and it says, or, or if you would rather, explore with us a sudden cessation of stupidity. Just wake up. Pull your head out of the sand or the clouds or wherever else it's been. Wake up from your stupor of living in a cloud of stupidity and blissful ignorance and just wake up and look around and see what's possible. And that's what this book is all about. The, the possibilities, uh, they talked about 100 mile per gallon cars, houses without furnaces. Now, incidentally, the car companies have been testing 100 mile per gallon prototypes since 1980 that we know of, and some inventors claim that they go farther back than that. But the idea that you can only get 20 or 30 miles of the gallon of gasoline is uh, a popular fantasy that's promoted in America. Now we have the spectacle of car companies actually bragging about a 40 mile per gallon vehicle when the 60s and 70 mile per gallon vehicles have been all over the streets of Europe for the last 10 years. High mileage cars have been sold all over the world, but they are not for sale in America. The, you know, the, the media and the oil companies, the whole, what, um, what Nancy Turner Banks refers to as the, the worship of the church of money. We have the church of money in America. Big, big money. People have five, ten, fifteen billion dollars in the bank, and they say, in order to say, I, I can't pay my people a living wage because I only got twenty-two billion in the bank. I have three kids at home. I have a wife and three kids, and so we need to move ahead. We need forty or fifty billion dollars. Uh, we, as a society, we tolerate that kind of mental illness. That's not greed. That's a mental illness, and uh, we have to wake up and face the fact that a, a fraction of our population has psychopathic tendencies. And if we don't do something about it, our society will continue to deteriorate. So, there's just there's so much that's happened in the last, you know, great moments in history in the last 30 years that, um, you know, the Berlin Wall came down and we thought we were going to be have a peace dividend. But you notice after the Berlin Wall came down, suddenly there was a war in Iraq and an international war on terrorism basically starting in 1991. The United States just converted into a permanent war economy and it's escalated. So we are today, as uh, many authors have spelled out, we're living in the final stages of a period of 
runaway, unregulated capitalism that is uh, killing the middle class in America and destroying the environment. And so the alternatives are all over the place and we're going to talk about it. We'll go, just go down the order. Those of you talk about the pharmaceutical industry for just a minute. In this country, the pharmaceutical and, and uh, the, you know, the HMOs, the medical industry, is all kind of lumped into one. But we have, uh, America stands alone in having the only real for-profit healthcare system among all the other civilized countries. We're the only one that allows runaway greed and the drive for profits to make profits off sick people and make profits off of letting people die when they could be treated. The insurance companies actually have employees that their jobs now are to sit on the phone and deny claims while people are in the hospital in the process of needing a, an operation or a transplant or something like that. Um, if you ran an HMO and tried to run uh, an HMO in Europe the way they do it here, the police would just come out and arrest you. It's against the law. It's you know, healthcare is considered a universal right in virtually every other modern country on earth. And the reason we don't have universal health care in America is that we as a nation have allowed ourselves to live in this bubble of media generated ignorance saying that the American healthcare system is the best there is. Oh, we don't want what Sweden has, or Germany, or Great Britain, or Canada. We don't want socialized medicine. They have completely distorted or you know, reframed the concept of what's happening around the world. And, you know, the concept of universal health care is a single payer system. It's not communist or socialist, it's just a single payer system where everybody is covered. And uh, if you spend any time logging on the internet, uh, looking at some articles talking about what's going on in other countries, uh, one of the reasons that Hugo Chavez from Venezuela gets so much flack is that they're, they're actually making poor people richer, wealthier in Venezuela. They're using their oil profits to help move the country forward. Uh, the people have uh, voted to you know, have universal health care, uh, universal education. Many other countries have some form of universal education which is now considered a basic right, just like access to enough food and water. These things are considered universal rights in many other countries, but not here. So, it's time we wake up and do what they do in Japan. Uh, Japan doesn't tolerate a CEO saying that I, I make 400 times more than my, my average worker because I'm working. That's obscene. You know, the next closest country to us in worker ratio, CEO to worker, is Brazil at 57 to 1. Japan, Germany, the Netherlands, most of those other countries, uh, a CEO might make 10, 12, or 14 times as much as the average worker, but not three, four, or 500 times. In Japan, they just say, uh, yeah, if you want to make that kind of money and you know, rip off your workers, just go out back and commit Harry Carey. You're a disgrace to our country. They just, the, the social network doesn't tolerate that kind of thinking. So people don't grow up thinking, well, I can make $5,000 an hour because I'm worth it. I mean, what's wrong with this picture here? Uh, so, the, the first, as they said, on any of any of these subjects that we're talking about, the first step is to get a copy of any one of these books, Censor News, uh, incidentally, a history of the medical industry in this country, a good history of the pharmaceutical industry, and what they've done over the last 150 years, marketing various kinds of chemicals to Americans at exorbitant prices, is contained in this book here, AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. And it talks about the original opium trade, the diamond trade, how profits from illegal drug mining around the world have been used to prop up um, the corporate bottom lines of uh, several major corporations that have been involved in drug and money laundering, you know, for the last 50, 60 years. 
So the, the drug problem in America is, is not just a few crack cocaine people on the streets of Chicago and Los Angeles. Big business is involved. And the, the international drug trade has been a major funder of the CIA's black ops programs and military operations around the world that are, are not funded through our Congress. Uh, and it's the, the amount of uh, money that's being used funneled into uh, black ops is, is billions a year from, from the drug trade. So if anyone is interested, you know, you can, this is Dr. Nancy Turner Banks, the book came out in 2010. You can order it through bookstores, you can get it on Amazon. It's a, this one is one of the best also that gives a history, a uh, whole history of the so-called AIDS epidemic in America. Uh, and the reason people need to know that uh, now is that uh, the insurance companies, the insurance companies are uh, sponsoring a program to give away free bogus HIV tests that don't test for HIV. They just react to particles in your bloodstream when you're ill or you had a childhood illness or like 108 different conditions. But the one that really stands out is pregnancy. They've known since 1987 that these tests will react to healthy women carrying a baby. And the babies will test positive on this test for the first 18 months of their lives because their immune systems aren't fully formed yet. That's a body of knowledge now that is very, very large. It was one of the top 10 blacked out subjects in 1997. The database on what I'm telling you was big back then. It's 10 times larger now. There, there's no debate on this. The, the, American media, the American media is promoting the myth that we still have an AIDS epidemic when the World Health Organization put out a report four years ago this June saying it's over. There was never any heterosexual AIDS epidemic. There won't be any heterosexual AIDS epidemic. They're still promoting the idea there's AIDS in Africa because it's a market to give away toxic drugs and make billions. They just simply develop markets in other countries for drugs that are banned in America, and uh, they keep extracting billions from people that are just defenseless and don't know any better. So uh, the solution, if you know anybody that has kids or grandkids, the parents have to know that they have to protect their kids from the bogus testing network nationwide. The lawsuits are coming up through the courts like they did against asbestos and tobacco. The lawsuits are against the manufacturers of the testing kits and the manufacturers of the toxic drugs that were used to poison people. Poison people. Lawsuits are huge, you know, $100 billion worth. It's as big as, AIDS is basically the, uh, the Tuskegee experiment, manufactured, uh, magnified by a thousand. For any of those of you that don't know about the Tuskegee experiment, look it up. It was uh, doctors followed uh, the progression of people who had syphilis without, for years, without telling them that penicillin was a treatment. They let a whole bunch of people die but just to, as an experiment with guinea pigs. Is that about the size of it, for those of you that are familiar with that? Yeah, um, does that relate to AIDS? Well, uh, <coughs> the, the AIDS, AIDS is the same kind of thing. Okay, a, a lot of people are having uh, trouble understanding that uh, as we say, just wake up and look at the evidence that shows, this book in particular shows uh, the decision was made in 1983 to announce a fatal new virus at a press conference. They were going to pick a harmless virus that didn't really do anything, but they would announce it at a press conference and all the environmental illnesses creeping up on us from the chemical companies and especially people that were overusing recreational drugs, overusing antibiotics, all these people would be told they're HIV positive. Here, start taking the medicine that will combat the virus. Uh, it turns out uh, there's no debate on this fact either. The medicine that they gave was a chemical left over from the 60s. Here's the book that was written on it. This was one of the first books. This is from 1991. Like 21 years ago, it's called Poison by Prescription, the AZT story. The very first chemical that was pulled off a shelf and run through clinical trials was a fatal chemotherapy poison that was unfit for human use in any low dose. 
they knew during the clinical trials that they had to give blood transfusions and various other things to keep people alive because they knew they were being poisoned during the short clinical trials. They cut the trials short and then they, they renamed this chemical, they called it an antiviral drug. Because one, one doctor said, uh, several doctors actually on the FDA panel originally resigned, they wouldn't be part of it. They said, that's not an antiviral drug, that, that's like taking rat poison four times a day for the rest of your life. Yeah, and uh, you know, it sounds funny now, you know, a doctor back then they said, well, nobody's going to want to take rat poison for $1,000 a month if they know it's rat poison. We've got to rename it something beneficial. Let's call it an antiviral drug. <coughs> That's what they did. And there, there's a book called Wrongful Death uh, that describes the intentional poisoning of 30,000, roughly 30,000 a year. 300,000 young Americans, mostly in the gay and minority communities, died. We were told, the media was telling us that these people were dying of AIDS when actually they were, they were being poisoned by the pharmaceutical industry. So that's the story that's emerged. The future is a whole lot brighter for kids that are growing up today. You have to get to the parents, have them log on to these websites and find out what's going on around the world. All the rest of the world is reporting that there's no AIDS epidemic now. It's over. It's officially over. So that should be a piece of good news for anybody that's got a child or a teenager, uh, you know, that's being told, well, don't don't have sex until you're 50 years old or until you get married, whichever comes first. That's not working real good in some high schools. But so, you know, how many young lives have been ruined and, uh, with a, an HIV positive diagnosis is like a voodoo curse. People believe they're going to get sick and it affects their immune system. The reason that the drug, the drug companies, we talk about the pharmaceutical industry, the insurance industry, they're giving away these free tests to establish, they stamp your medical records HIV positive. It's a pre-existing condition. If they can stamp 100 or 200,000 medical records HIV positive per year, they don't have to provide affordable health care. They can charge anything they want. So they're, they're off to the races again. It's just the, the American uh, pharmaceutical industry is always looking for new markets to uh, generate income. And they, uh, they target young, uh, young people in you know, grade school that are hyperactive. Uh, they're called uh, attention deficit disorder. Uh, Tom Hartman talks about this all the time. He said, you know, these are these are the people that are, you know, genetically like the hunter gatherers. The best hunters were people that were alert. They were they were always alert. They didn't sit still for very long. They were always moving around. That was their makeup. They were alert. Nothing crept up on them. You know, they they were different from the farmers that could do a monotonous job eight hours a day and be content with it. You know, if if you recognize these behavioral differences among children growing up, they don't have to be drugged with things that, uh, you know, make them much calmer and, uh, you know, half a zombie. No. Docile is the word. Make kids docile so that they'll sit in class and, uh, and not complain about anything or just, you know, follow the educational system in America. You go to class for 40 minutes, you study something, the bell rings, get a lobotomy and run over there. No, you know, five minutes later you start studying something different. Our whole educational system is designed to crank out people that are, that are going to be good cogs in the machine. They're, they're not independent thinkers. Um, the law schools in America do not teach much about what happened at Nuremberg or the concept that just because politicians make up some laws that you should automatically go along with. You have a question, Tim? Well, I noticed that you've gone on for about 30 minutes now on the basic premise of your thing. We haven't really heard any solutions yet. And I'm just, you know, okay. trying to keep the, the premise moving along a little bit more. So I'm, I'm not trying okay. to... Uh, Tim has an observation. He think my, my whole thesis is you can't understand a solution to a problem if you don't even recognize there's a problem. Okay. So, so as, as I just, uh, on the first subject that's listed there, there's the pharmaceutical industry, there's alternative medicine handbooks that talk about natural cures for all kinds of things. Uh, we, we could save 
hundreds of billions of dollars at least on prescription drugs, like um, a classic treatment for, uh, for a thing called gout is uh, cherry juice, raw cherries, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other things like that. There are uh, a lot of different kinds of natural drugs. Uh, Doc Mike knows all about this kind of stuff. That and, and other alternative health care practitioners that have been attacked by our uh, own FDA because our whole system is designed to make as much money as possible while treating people and keeping them in a state of treatment for a long time rather than cure it. There's a whole slew of, uh, I have a book called The Alternative Medicine Handbook. It was published in 1998 or something. It's like a like a dictionary, and it's updated every couple years. There's another one called uh, The Cure for the Top 20 Forms of Cancer. There's all kinds of uh, natural cures. Also, there's a, a growing uh, body of knowledge on uh, diet and how uh, diet uh, is, uh, affects people, especially with diabetes, uh, high, high blood pressure, cholesterol. A lot of these things are diet related. They're not hereditary. And uh, there's a growing body of knowledge that shows just uh, trying to lose weight and uh, keep your total weight down within reasonable limits goes a long way toward giving you a better outlook and better chance of surviving more years with less complications. The insurance companies are beginning to hone in on this and, and uh, treat being overweight as uh, part of a reason why they, they don't want to provide affordable health insurance. Uh, other other countries recognize this, and health and wellness. You know, there's all kinds of health and wellness programs, but a lot of them in this country too. But you just have to just wake up one day and start looking for them. Don't 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 keep listening to the news and let them tell us about the latest uh, antidepressant uh, drug. Also, uh, Americans you know spend more on antidepressants than any other country on earth. We could save a lot of money if we looked at, at natural causes uh, and natural cures solutions. One thing we haven't mentioned, uh, the chemical industry, right now there's something called fracking. That's uh, hydraulic fracturing, uh, pumping all kinds of chemicals that you used to have to pay to get rid of. They're pumping that stuff into wells. It makes water catch on fire. And it, it destroys the water table and uh, forces the natural gas to bubble up to the surface. Uh, that's a problem that's not in the news. They're, right now they're in the process of, de of destroying the water table <coughs> under Pennsylvania and New York. And uh, they, they plan to build pipelines, water pipelines from the Great Lakes to pump water to Pennsylvania for drinking water because they won't be able to run their wells anymore. The solution to that kind of a problem the solution is to wake up and realize that we don't need that natural gas, that solar, wind power, high efficiency especially, all the energy alternatives that would allow us to run the country on far less energy than we use today, those, uh, those solutions are being implemented. Uh, in, they're being implemented in various places around this country. Uh, we have almost no media coverage of the benefits of these big wind farms that are going up in southern Illinois. We got 20 of them here in Illinois. There's a big one down I-65 in Indiana that's 20 miles long. Huge wind farms. These people aren't putting these up because they just want to uh, waste money rather than giving it to the banksters to be ripped off on their 401ks. Uh, no. Wind, wind, wind generated energy has been cheaper than fossil fuel, all else being equal. You know, if you level the playing field and quit subsidizing fossil fuel, wind and solar are cheaper today, and the price is still coming down. Uh, so, you know, Germany put up, you talk about solutions, you know, uh, Germany put up enough solar panels already to shut down 20 nuclear power plants or displace that much energy. Um, on, the, on the back of that flyer, you know, they, they talk about the five pillars, you know, shifting the renewable energy, and uh, a, a sudden shift to renewable energy, 
transforming the building stock, 190 million buildings in, in the 27 European countries, is that every building can be converted to a small generator of energy. Just collect the energy, some of the energy, 10,000 times more light falls on us every day than what the human race uses. We collect one ten thousandth of the energy that falls on the planet. We don't need coal, oil, gas, or nukes. That's a giant solution to the global warming problem that we're seeing from the burning of fossil fuel. But people have to embrace the knowledge. They have to talk to their friends and neighbors and let people know that there are, are builders that will build a house without a furnace for you if you want a new house. If you want to renovate an old one, you can make the house into a hybrid. Uh, make it a hybrid with various different kinds of things and cut the bills in half in a couple of weeks. And these things are beneficial. They're way better than for people that have money to invest or, you know, earning 1% uh, of a year in a CD. You have, if you have $10,000 in a CD earning interest and you're a homeowner, you can take that ten grand and cash it in and put solar panels on the roof today, and it will give you five times better rate of return than leaving it in the bank, earning interest. Those are the actual payback times, you know, changing lights to these. Nobody should be using old uh, current sucking filament type light bulbs. The new, uh, you know, new high efficiency LEDs and fluorescents are most of the time 100% return on your money. You know, you spent $5 on a bulb and saved $5 on the combat bill in a year. Usually it's twice that. Usually they'll pay for themselves in a few months, not, not years like what we were taught. So. The Chicago stores, incidentally, uh, the big stores, hardware stores, they all have a huge blend now of high efficiency lights. New refrigerators use a fifth as much electricity as a 20-year-old box. Mm -hmm. Most new refrigerators run on a dime a day, three bucks a month. You know, that's, that's, I mean, yeah, three dollars a month, a dime a day, that's fairly common. Mm -hmm. And it would, it would be a, a huge benefit nationwide. We could shut down all the nuclear power plants in the next few years shut down most of the coal plants also as we're switching over to wind, solar, wave power, and, and uh, some natural gas as backup turbines. But yeah, we, we could do a whole evening on the, the energy efficiency solutions if that were scheduled around Earth Day like we normally do. So there, there will probably be a lot of things going on Earth Day this year talking about you know, the, the energy efficient global revolution that's talked about in this book, The Third Industrial Revolution. It's um, five major pillars. And um, once, once we get switching to alternate fuels worldwide, and uh, there are countries that are, are running fleets of hydrogen powered cars and buses right now. Hydrogen is a very good uh, fuel to use in Portland. It's a storage medium. Uh, this is what he's talking about. Uh, but uh, basically, you have uh, uh, hybrid electric drives, not just electric cars. Uh, hybrid, hybrid electric cars are going to be the most efficient if they're aerodynamic. But in any case, uh, we have decent battery technology today that will allow companies to put 100 mile per gallon hybrid cars on the road that use gasoline. There's no reason why we can't have 100 mile per gallon hybrid cars because Rocky Mountain Institute, they designed a, a Lexus, uh, an SUV the size of an RX 300 Lexus. An SUV, modest size, that got 99 miles of the gallon. And that was developed basically a decade ago. This is not something new. The car companies are working on it and there's a revolution in, in the auto transport coming. This summer, there's a company called Bright Automotive. We'll have, have to see if they actually go through with their announcement last year that they were going to put a, a one-ton delivery vehicle on the road that gets 100 miles of the gallon this summer. So uh, if, if it happens, you know, uh, that was an announcement that was made about a year ago. That in mid-2012, America would see its first affordable 100 mile per gallon hybrid vehicle on the road. And you know, for not, not a two hundred thousand dollar vehicle either. Okay. Uh, the third third quick category, we'll talk about uh, what's happening in the business of education because America is almost unique 
and a lot of young lives, many, many, many young lives that are in 7th, 8th grade, freshman, sophomore, and high school right now, those lives can be saved. They, those people can be prevented from becoming debt slaves to a bank if the parents and the counselors begin to tell them that you don't want to sign up to spend tens of thousands of dollars to get credit hours that you can't use after you get out of college. Uh, uh, there's a great credit hour scam being run on the population right now with for-profit schools. Uh, the Phoenix program is one of them. Some of them are online. Uh, we're, we're in the early <coughs> stages of the public finding out about this scandal. Where most, most people now that have studied the financial collapse of the last few years are familiar with the name Bernie Madoff. <laughs> Uh, he was the one that ran a Ponzi scheme on his friends for 15 or 20 years and took $65 billion off of basically his close friends who were people that had money to invest. And so we're looking at people with no ethics, no morals, and no conscience. And uh, I've always I've watched over the last 30 years that in every economic downturn, when, you, uh, when, it's getting, when people are getting laid off a little bit, it gets hard to find a job. The Amway distributors, the diamond distributors, come out of the woodwork and start to recruit new distributors. They say, oh, you can be a rich and famous diamond distributor if you'll just follow the program. So Amway sucks in a lot of people that move their products while they are slave labor to the corporation. And it's all done under the guise of, quote, building your own business. It's a cancer on American society, the way Walmart is a cancer on American society. Um, if the solution to this is to wake up, wake up and say, we'll take a few hundred along with 10,000 of our other neighbors and go down there and protest. We won't allow Walmart to be built in this area. We, we want, want some other kind of store. We want to pay higher prices. Uh, this isn't the time to argue higher prices. Wal uh, <laughs> but since we got a comment from the gallery here about higher prices, Walmart takes money out of any community that it puts a store in. Walmart, uh, the solution to uh, loss of jobs and things is not allow Walmart to go in there, but the solution is to try to entice other businesses or work with the city. There's all kinds of other businesses that could be given the same kind of tax break that they give to Walmart. Walmart doesn't set up a store anywhere they don't get tax breaks. And they encourage their employees to sign up for food stamps, to sign up for uh, you know low income benefits. Uh, a lot of well, since Walmart pays below a poverty wage, Walmart employees by definition are going to be struggling to survive. Right. And um, for that reason, we have allowed ourselves to be misled by the press, all the positive press. Walmart is a multi-billion dollar corporation. They can buy ads. They can control the press. That this new Walmart, that where was the latest one that opened in Chicago, it makes it sound like a, a great boom to that community. But Walmart is not bringing any living wage jobs into there at all. So, you know, it, it's a, we need to create uh, get back to the concept that if a person is, is, is working a decent job, whatever it is, they deserve a decent wage. Um, and that, you could have a whole other discussion on that for a whole night. But over the last 30 years, we've allowed ourselves to be hitched down to the point where many middle, formerly middle class jobs, salespeople working at Sears or J.C. Penney's or Target, a, a lot of the retail community you know, 30 years ago, a sale, an appliance salesman at Sears used to be able to make a living working a 40-hour week. That's all changed with the slow erosion of good-paying jobs in America compared to the cost of living. So, again, you know, other countries are showing us the solutions. Uh, other, there are businesses you can log on. I forget how many websites there are that talk about American companies that make things in America and they pay their workers a good, you know, union scale living wage. Unions are not evil like the press has been telling us over the last 30 or 40 years. You know, uh, uh, working class people 
and especially union organization, mm -hmm. is, is responsible, was responsible for the growth of the middle class in America coming out yes. of World War II. Yes, it was. And uh, that, and, and since, since 1973, the concept of a decent paying job in America has been under solid attack, you know, since 73. That was the year we peaked. And it's been slightly downhill ever since with um, middle class jobs versus the cost of living. So, there's all kinds of studies coming out showing that a young person can go to uh, various different kinds of, you know, local colleges, a trade school, uh, something where they don't incur a lot of debt uh, or get on the job training rather than uh, get a four year college degree, come out with twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars in debt and live home with mom and dad with no hope of getting a job because the jobs aren't in America. We need to embrace the companies that are making stuff in America, encourage them to add more workforce, buy American, support the idea that a country needs to manufacture things if you're going to make, if you're going to have a middle class. Yes. A country that doesn't manufacture things has no middle class. And that, that's, that, that's not a debatable issue. Uh, that's a basic tenet, a raw tenet of economics. That you, you cannot, you know, a country cannot survive with a service economy. You have to manufacture stuff and add value with human labor, adding value to raw materials to make a product that you can sell and trade with other countries and other states. That's basic economics. And we've lost sight of that over the last 30 years. We're, we're living in uh, the final stages of the bubble of Reaganomics, and people are waking up. Uh, all over the country, people are waking up and saying, "There's, uh, we, we can do better. We can definitely do better on a variety of fronts. But we have to recognize it starts with the realization that our media has been promoting certain pieces of mythology that are considered ridiculous in other countries all over the world. And then once, if we had, a, as Amory Lovins pointed out 32 years ago, a sudden cessation of stupidity, just step back with an open mind, look at the evidence, look at what makes common sense, or ask, ask the question, what's wrong with this picture? How can we do it better? There was a book published, uh, you know, about the educational system. There was a book published called Compulsory Miseducation, the case for closing down our school system and reopening something else in its place. That was like 35 years ago. They, uh, the, the basic concept of reading, writing, arithmetic, literacy can be taught in about 100 hours of instruction. It doesn't take years. Our school systems are conditioning people to be, you know, docile public servants are serving the rich rather than creative thinking individuals that can think and work for themselves and, and create a better life. You know, people have all kinds of creative abilities if they're not, their lives aren't uh, stunted and distorted with two jobs of slave labor wages for the rest of their life where they're in a constant state of exhaustion. So, um, Let's wake up. Let's start uh, start talking about universal education like they have in many other countries. You know, uh, many of the European countries, uh, you go from grade school all the way through university. If you qualify for a college degree, it's free. They call it university. They don't call it college. But 85% of the rest go to various different trade schools. And the system works. It works well. And people, you don't need for you know, hundred thousand dollars of credit hours in something in order to do a really good job in this manufacturing plant or whatever it is. There's all kinds of things that you know people can do without wasting four years. Uh, you know, there, there's this myth that's being promoted in America that you have to have a college degree in order to be a good employee. Well, you need an education. An education is different from a college degree. Our colleges turn out some of the most terrifyingly ignorant people on the face of the earth. And 
you know, Jay Leno was all stars, you know, where he interviews people on the street asking them questions, is a good example of that. We have college graduates that are, are, are unfit for the employment market. And so just getting a college degree and spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year and coming out with massive debt, that doesn't mean you're an educated person or that you're going to be a good employee. You know, we, we need to take a look at what our system is doing. What about high schools? Well, high schools are a whole other ball game. Uh, the question is what about high schools? Well, high schools did not do a lot better than they are for a variety of reasons again. Uh, it's uh, one author remarked that in America, the schools that need the money least, the schools that live in rich districts and have a better tax base, those schools get more money when they really don't need it. While schools in, in poorer areas that actually need help, they don't get help because they are, they're a poor area. You know, public education is, is not well funded in America like it used to be you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. What about New Jersey? I, I don't know about New Jersey, so you can handle that on rebuttal. I haven't studied New Jersey, so I'm not going to comment on it. Let's move on. The last thing, uh, the fourth thing on this list, and it's worth mentioning, is that um, in the military-industrial complex, one of, the, one of the three biggest myths of the last 30 years, and it's reflected That myth is reflected in the Censor 12 book. The Censor, in the Censor 2011, they also talked about a problem and a solution. The problem is more of our soldiers are dying of suicide now than are dying in combat. When they come back to America, they can't live with what they did over there, and they can't live with the conditions that they're facing over here. The suicide problem in the American military is an epidemic, and the reason for that, the reason for that is that since 1980, our soldiers have been told that they've been defending American freedoms worldwide. When they get out there on the ground, they find out they're killing women and children to clear the land for oil companies or mining interests or whatever else it is, but it's moving population off the land where there's resources. It has nothing to do with defending the freedoms of America. America has Canada to the north, which is one of our friends. We have Mexico to the south. We're not, we're not worried about the Mexican army invading us. And we have water, vast oceans on both sides. America is a very secure nation. We could have an army and a navy the tenth of the size of what it is and adequately defend our country. The present military budget is a trillion dollars a year, roughly. We have 5% of the world's people. We spend twice as much. The rest of the world spends about 500 billion. Another 95% of the people. We spend a trillion dollars, our 5%, on about 800 bases that are scattered around the country in what many people are now calling the, the global military dominance program. The people that own and run uh, the military industrial complex in America have a goal of controlling the resources all over the planet. And our soldiers are finding out when they go out and fight in these so-called wars, they find that the ratio, the kill ratio in Iraq was 500 to 1, some pace of 1,000 to 1. We kill 1,000 women and children, they kill one of our soldiers. That's not a war. That's a controlled slaughter, a controlled genocide. And that's what our troops are involved in. And, they're fine. and many of them, uh, when they get back with various post-traumatic stress syndrome problems they have, they can't live with it. The solution is staring us in the face. The solution has been implemented by countries all over the world. They're saying, why should we waste our money sending our troops to some foreign land to die when we've got cheaper energy alternatives falling on us every day from the sun? If you, if you take the military money and spend it in your own society, you, you get much better bang for the buck. You're not uh, wasting lives every year like uh, the U.S. military does. And we can move away from the militarization of the planet 
toward a peaceful revolution where everybody could have enough food, enough shelter. There's enough food to feed the planet. It's just not being distributed properly because we're being told that those people don't have enough money to buy food so they don't get it in foreign countries. Uh, a lot of foreign countries are being told, well, you have to grow stuff and export to the rich countries so they don't have enough food left over for their own people. It's a massive distortion. And Venezuela and other uh, Central American countries are showing the way. They're reversing these trends. The, the, the trends toward this kind of stuff are being reversed all over the world, but you have to look to other sources to find these beneficial solutions. There's hundreds of books that are available. The portal websites, uh, anybody who wants a card with those websites on it, see me afterwards. Uh, there's some good websites, uh, the Common Dreams is one of them especially, that posts the best of the best every day without all the junk food news. So if you want to know, it, uh, there's a website called Want to Know Info that has beneficial solutions. Their motto is, you know, a, a brighter future for everyone, or a brighter future. It's called Want to Know Info, uh, I think, dot com. Uh, but it's 16 different disciplines on that site. Healthcare, energy, the environment, uh, the solution to the fear that's been generated since 9-11. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is that without 9-11, without the military-industrial complex would not have been able to do what it did in the last 10 years. Uh, the rest of the world has been moving toward uh, peaceful solutions to all kinds of things, realizing that uh, if you take the money that you spend on ships and planes and just spend that on energy facilities, <coughs> You, you're better off and you, uh, you have money left over to use in your country rather than using the military trying to defend oil uh, pipelines or oil wells around the world. So we're, we're in the final stages really of the idea that oil and coal and gas, especially nukes, we're in the final stages of uh, those pieces of mythology. Incidentally, the 2012 book, one of the top 25 blacked out subjects of the year, it's titled the fairy tale of nuclear power. Uh, it's, it's a fairy tale. The idea that you can get affordable electricity or affordable energy out of a nuke is a fairy tale that's been promoted by the American media since 1967. They, it's a two-step process in America. You promote the myth and you black out the reality. And uh, so the, the final thought here before we open up For those of you that have never seen a, a simple demonstration with a grill from, this is a brand new grill from a stove, right? It's made out of cast iron. And here's, here's an ordinary torch. Just turn it on. Wherever I go, I, I give a simple demonstration and then ask the audience what's happening here. Yeah, the, the torch is like 1,800 degrees on the tip of that flame. It's like a hot mixture of propane and butane. But that metal up there is not even getting red hot. Everybody see that? The rest of this, the, down here where I'm holding it in my hand, it's not even getting warm. We have millions of Americans, millions of Americans are still living under the illusion, the fairy tale that was told to us in broad daylight on September 11th that the steel curtains just melted and poof, the buildings fell down. Yeah. We go again. Well, all of these books I've got to talk about 9-11. Yeah, the books good feel nice. On the night of 9-11, intelligence agencies all over the world knew it was an inside job. Everybody that manufactures steel and make grills for stoves, take a survey of your own. Ask if anybody knows where they have to go to buy a new grill because they burn, they melt their grills every now and then when they're not paying attention to uh, cooking their lasagna. Yeah, I, I've never been able to find anybody, uh, the stores that I near me, 
They don't even sell new grills. They say, what are you talking about melting your grill? Your grill doesn't melt. You know, they're cast iron or they're steel. It, it, converters in buildings, if you don't want them to melt in office fires or any kind of fire, if you want the building to be solid, you make it out of steel. America has been driven by the fairy tale myth that the buildings just steel melted and whoop, the buildings came down and it was a successful attack by Al Qaeda. Now we gotta go bomb Iraq and we gotta go bomb Afghanistan and hunt for Osama. Well, if we dispel that myth, that one myth, the myth of 9-11, which was created to be our new Pearl Harbor, was an inside job. All the intelligence agencies knew it on the 9-11, all over the world. No debate. The American press sold us the myth from the time the two planes hit and the smoke was in the air. They were putting out all the basic tenets of that myth. That it was, it was Osama bin Laden, it was Al-Qaeda, it was not, and these hijackers. The media had the script before the planes hit. They were in on it. There's no doubt that they were in on it because the media reported the collapse of Building 7 after it, it was controlled demolition. The media reported that building on, and it was broadcast worldwide 25 minutes before the building came down. The, the reporter is standing out there three blocks away from the building. It's over her back shoulder in the skyline, and she's reporting the script they gave her that Building 7 has collapsed. We, we hope it was evacuated. There's no loss of life. And there's, there's no debate on this anymore. So the idea that you can still debate it is offensive. The, the idea that you can still debate whether the earth is flat or round when lives are at stake is offensive. It's called offensive ignorance. And the solution, the solution to what's happened to our country since 9-11, the big solution is to stand up anywhere when you talk to people and say, 9-11 was a myth. It's time to pull our heads out of the sand and move forward and make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, we've... We've lived through, well, it's 11 years now. Since 9-11, uh, this is 2012, we're in the 11th year of the greatest wealth transfer from the poor and the middle class into the coffers of some rich people. We haven't seen a transfer of wealth like this since the pharaohs walked the earth. You know, trillions and trillions of dollars are being transferred from uh, a, a defenseless, you know, uh, inundated, uh, you know, uh, depressed middle class who people see, they don't see any hopeful solutions because hopeful solutions aren't on our news. You know, every night you get a, a well, I, the five categories, rape, robbery, murder, train wreck, and plane crash. That's what makes the news. One of those five rough main categories, some kind of disaster, whether it's local or a 7-Eleven shoot-up, somebody died, that fills the airwaves, giving people the impression that that's what's happening. You don't hear about 10,000 teenagers that are volunteering at local hospitals and everything else. You know, in, uh, there's all kinds of volunteers helping make things better. They're not doing it for the money. You know, there's a great American spirit of people, the families helping families, neighbors helping neighbors. We're seeing uh, neighbors helping neighbors right now avoid foreclosure, uh, you know, by taking up collections and all kinds of things. People are helping people stay in their homes like we haven't seen since 1929, 1930, since the last crash. But it's not enough. It's not enough. We, we have to collectively begin to make phone calls to our senators, congressmen, write letters, let them know that we've had enough. That we, we want we want to move forward. And so um, let's open it to questions and uh okay. All right. All right, Andy, you know, you you I like the basic I like the basic concept of your topic, an evening of solutions, but I was still rather lacking in hearing like a story of a solution or several examples of giving it. I mean, you, you did allude to websites, you did allude to things. Can you enlighten us with at least one or two 
concrete examples of solutions. Like, you know, what about these homes that run on squirrel cage fans? What about this stuff in Germany? Can you just at least give us a couple of examples of real solutions that are working? Okay, uh, I, I've talked about it so many times, I, I probably, you know, you forget to mention things, you only have an hour. You can talk for several hours if you run down a list of examples. I personally took our adult students in our energy efficient classes in 1981. Uh, we, we toured one of the houses in Schaumburg that were being built with no furnace with a guaranteed heating bill of $10 a month. There's, a, there's hundreds of homes scattered from Aurora through Schaumburg, Palatine, all the way to the Wisconsin border on the west side, you know, on the suburbs, 20 miles west of here. They've been building those homes since 1979. Ordinary looking houses, ordinary prices. The difference is they have windows that don't lose heat, the walls are two inches thicker, and they have a fresh air exchanger that brings in fresh air. So uh, houses without furnaces that heat for 10 bucks a month have been built all across scattered places in our western suburbs for the last, well, since 1979. That's 33 years now, right? That's, right. Well, that's one concrete solution. But, and but, it's on, it's incidentally, that's listed on this this, this flyer here yeah. uh, as, you know, things that are too good to be true that the media doesn't talk about. I mean, about. I, I know what it's... What else a, were you looking for? for like, well, well, for example, the heat pump was, is a good example of how they can do that. You have some of the uh, extra insulation, triple glazed windows things like that. We um, could do a whole evening on mm -hmm. home construction. If you right, no, no, I'm just saying, but you, you, there's a list of litanies. Now say, for example, uh, talk about the, I mean, when you have the uh, the blacked out media, I mean, I know myself, I can go right now to Al Jazeera online and pull up the news from the Middle East. Uh, another th revolutionary thing is how, how to conduct the revolution in countries with Gene Sharpen, his book on uh, From Dictatorship to Democracy. I'm just looking for a well, I think you might have just mentioned that you can pull up the website. Al Jazeera reports a lot of what's going on in the world that's not in the mainstream press here. Right. You know, other, other, other news sources all over the world are easily accessible via the Internet. You can just log on to these sites and learn what's happening in other countries. But you know, this is my whole point, that Americans are maintained in a bubble of ignorance by our main media, <laughs> unless you know where the sites are. And, and uh, it, it's like... The, the list that I carry on, on cards, they're called portal websites. Mm -hmm. Each one of these sites is like a doorway into the other world where all the beneficial news is in. There's ten sites on this card. Can you name them real quick for the benefit yes. of our audience? Yeah, uh, one of them is called Common Dreams. That, that's, uh, that's kind of, these are all www, yeah, it's commondreams.org. There's one called the Smirking Chimp. <laughs> And that was uh, founded in honor of our Smirking Chimp president in the year 2000 when Bush was elected. That's the SmirkingChimp.com. There's one called the one called Truthout, Truthout.org, that's run by a, a former college teacher and professor, uh, William Rivers Pitt. Uh, these sites are, are uh, portal websites because each of them is a collection of uh, a lot of good stuff. Uh, that shows up there first and goes viral out on the internet. Rocky Mountain Institute is rmi.org. That's what uh, he, uh, he just asked about. Tim asked about, uh, it's a house up in the mountains of Colorado. They got no heating bill on a $5 a month electric bill for 3,000 square feet. The place was built in 1984. No furnace up in the mountains where it's 20 below zero. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, uh, for those of you that are interested about the AIDS epidemic, virusmith.com is the one that has 2,700 doctors, researchers, and scientists that have been publishing that material for 25 years. And this is not one person with an opinion. Uh, for, for, I, I also listed, uh, I told you before, but the best, the most hopeful website with solutions of all kinds is that thing called Want to Know Info. It's, a, it's an informational site that summarizes the research, a huge body of data on 16 different subjects, and you can print out one and two page summaries, 10 page summaries. It's just a fantastic resource. Uh, we're, we're I'd like to comment on your final uh, uh, solution. Uh, no, 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 uh, there are a for you. Uh, and comments come at the, well, not comment, the, the next like to period. Ask a question the next on the final. Okay. All right. Uh, Bernie Connie, uh, 
Bob Manor, Wes Weiger. A couple of questions you <laughs> alluded to, uh, fracking not being present, uh, not being presented in mainstream media. I seem to recall first hearing about fracking on 60 Minutes, and I think they re-ran that episode. Would you consider 60 Minutes major media? Okay, uh, the, question, the question is about fracking. When we talk about, you know, coordinated media blackouts, you talk about the amount of time a subject gets covered versus the amount of time, amount of time an opposing viewpoint is shown. Something is, uh, is on television once or twice, or it's in a newspaper once or twice, but it's drowned out by dozens or hundreds of other hours of advertisements showing how safe the process is. If, you know, that 60 minutes, sure, if you were there to see it, you saw it one time. But all the rest of the months we're getting advertisements from the oil and the gas industry, the people that are drilling, uh, showing how, how safe it, clean coal, they call it. And uh, so, yeah, if, if, we have, if we have true media coverage, it wouldn't be on 60 Minutes once that you would recall. It would be on 60 Minutes and a bunch of other channels off and on in the news for two or three weeks straight until everybody in the public knows it. Like what we've got now with what Professor Green called uh, the greatest freak show on earth with the Republicans running for president. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's no way to describe it. They're, they're, they're giving us a freak show and there's no time left over to tell us about, like the story on 60 Minutes, the, the problems. Did 60 Minutes talk about the solutions? No, they talked about the problem. And they leave people with the impression that, yeah, there's some wells contaminated, but the oil companies uh, reimburse these people and uh, they give them tanks full of uh, you know, drinking water and that's it. They don't tell you that fracking is not needed or that it, it's, it's totally destructive of the groundwater and it's being used. It's a twofer. Uh, the people that are doing the fracking are getting, killing two birds with one stone. They're getting natural gas coming up where it used to be trapped in the rock, and they're getting rid of a whole bunch of toxic chemicals, cancer-causing chemicals, pumped into the ground that you used to have to uh, pay to get rid of or safely store or dispose of. Toxic waste. Those chemicals are being, you know, deposited and pumped down those wells, you know, thousands and thousands of gallons a day. So, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah, I, on, on every one of these subjects I've talked about, I recall seeing it once in the press. That's how they run a coordinated blackout. They'll cover it once and then they'll say, well, that, that's not news anymore. We're going on to something else. Follow up to that. Yeah, Andy, you were here last uh, week and you saw John Adel here in person. Yep. And you have to admit, he's an extraordinary person. Thank with you. the vision that he has and that can make things happen, you can see these bewildering projects through from beginning to end, uh, that's the kind of person that's a rare CEO type individual. And if, can you, if you were on the board of directors of a big company that has 30, 40 billion dollars in market capitalization, wouldn't you want to pay to, to get somebody like John Adel to run your company? Wouldn't you think you'd be worth paying like six or seven million? Wouldn't you think you'd get actually getting a good deal? If you can get somebody as competent as him, that's a visionary, that can make things happen, get all these people to come together and complete these humongous projects on time. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, uh, Bob just asked an excellent, excellent question. And I agree with him 100%. Some of you might, may find that a little strange that Bob and I agree on something. But occasionally we do. And Bob asked the question, uh, isn't it worth paying a CEO, you know, six or seven million dollars a year oh, yes. if he's uh, <laughs> able to, you know, motivate people and run a really beneficial project like what we saw last week? Yeah, six or seven million a year is not the same as a hundred million a year or 200 or 500 or a billion, or a billion. like uh, the hedge fund managers. I make two billion dollars a year because I'm worth it. You know, that's the philosophy I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, you know, a couple million here and there if somebody is 
really good and valuable to a company. That's a whole other ball game. You know, millions and billions are uh, an order of magnitude a thousand times apart. So yeah, I agree. Uh, corporations, you know, a guy like that that could make a lot of money for the company and everything, doing constructive things, would be worth maybe a few million a year. But you know, that we pay. Uh, you know, Michael Jordan made 25 million, and he entertained the country. I mean, we don't have a problem with that. But uh, it's not the same thing as is, is, is the wealth transfer for the rich with the banking ripoff and everything else. That's a whole other thing we're talking about. Wait, okay, next question. Yes, Wes Weiger. What about solutions and the current president? Uh, he asked uh, solutions on our current president. Um, we elect him. What, uh, my, my take on it, and a lot of other analysts have said the same thing, that since the time of John Kennedy, the president doesn't really run the country. A bunch of rich people that collectively have a net, work up, net worth up in the trillions, they basically own and operate our government uh, on key issues. And uh, you'll notice that Obama is exactly 180 degrees opposite from candidate Obama running for president. He didn't have a history in his background. He didn't have a history of trashing poor people and, and uh, not, not helping the middle class and a bunch of other stuff. He, he had a decent background from everything I studied. Uh, I thought, you know, he, he had uh, years of, uh, you know, good service for what he had. He wasn't in the Senate for very long. But when he got there, he inherited a crisis unlike anything this country has seen. And he, he inherited the greatest bank robbery in the history of the world. And um, there were some very, very powerful people. I, I would like to know ultimately if Obama was just simply given the, the John F. Kennedy speech saying, you can be the next John F. Kennedy if you mess with the money or if you mess with this, this, this. Uh, you'll be gone and we'll move somebody else in. The people that... The people that gave us 9-11 are still walking around free. Those people have immense power. They murdered 3,000 3, were killed on 9-11. Senator Paul Wellstone in 2002 was murdered to change yes. the, the total uh, the, the count in the Senate from 51 to 49 Absolutely. to, to trip it back to Republicans. So when Obama got into office, there's no way he could have known the previous administration wasn't made up of politicians, it was made up of killers. And he, uh, he inherited a huge can of worms. And, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of us have complaints that things didn't go as well. I think he could have used the bully pulpit, he could have fought for a lot of different things. But at the same time, he might have been, he and his wife may have been calculating just how much they could do and still stay alive. With the history of politicians being taken out and having heart attacks, accidents, plane crashes, you name it. I mean, the Bush administration sent a very strong message to Congress and the Senate. You're not dealing with us anymore, you're dealing with killers. And that's it. When we, but this isn't in the news, people don't know it. Uh, James Callahan. Okay, uh, I think you're doing a hell of a job, and I think you've got a good cause here. I'd like to start at the end of your speech, uh, where you ended with your final solution. After you made your demonstration on the, uh, the, the torch over there with the buildings can't come down, which you're right on the mark with that. But your solution needs a little bit more to be desired as far as going to our senators to talk to them. You know, or, or calling them. That's not going to work. I mean, there has to be more of a, you know, In other words, if you approach a politician, I don't know how many you have approached, let's just take it to the, if you approach the mayor of this city, the new mayor now, right? He's not going to give you a, a nanosecond. So the solution to, to this change that you want to make has to be much more covert and and power packed with better ideas. So well, I think you got to elaborate on a little more solutions on making the change. I think I understand this question. I think the question he said is, you know, could it, could I be more specific in uh, what we can do as a country right now to move after, to move out of the bubble of the current mentality of 9/11, and that we 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 can't do anything with our politicians. Well, uh, one of the things that's being shown and the mainstream press is not covering it all, but it's working, is uh, the so-called Occupy movement. You know, the, the Occupy movement with people uh, standing in uh, and saying, you know, sending cards and letters and phone calls to the politician isn't enough. You have to get a group of people 
preferably tens of thousands, to show up and head toward a senator or congressman's office or his home. You know, people have to stand up and get out in the streets and move. Uh, the, you know, the politicians don't care what we think as long as we don't take any kind of direct action that uh, disrupts the normal flow of daily life. You know, we, we have to do what they're doing in other countries and what they're doing in other states. Uh, you know, progress, progress happens when people say enough is enough and they get up and move in numbers. And that, that's, that's just history from all over the world. I agree with you 100%. But what's the trigger to get people to do it? Because they haven't done it even in this city, even in this neighborhood, or even in the that's state, right. well, both government. Well, and his question is, why haven't why have people... Where's the trigger? How do you well, get them to go? Well, the trigger, is, the, trigger is help, the trigger is helping people understand what Jeremy talked about in this book. He said for the last 30 years he's been writing about environmental issues in global warming, and he got it wrong. He said, I, I underestimated how fast it's happening. He said, my grandkids have no future. You know, we, we can't wait. It's always, a, oh, the old people are going to die off, and when the grandchildren and children, when they grow up, they'll make things better. Well, the grandchildren that are here now, what kind of planet they live on will be determined by what the grandparents do, the age of people in this room. Right. What we do now, we, we've got like three or four years to get a handle on global warming before it becomes irreversible, before the, the permafrost melts in Siberia and uh, the global warming cycle with the oceans rising becomes irreversible. So, you know, you have to, uh, you, know, you have to help people understand the urgency, uh, that it, it's a crisis that is not 5, 10, 15, 20 years away. I mean, we're called on to do something now, each of us, whatever we can do. Yay. So that, that's all I can say. Charles? I got a couple of questions, but Andy, you seem to have definite views on natural healing, alternative medicine, and so forth. And you have a natural bias towards traditional established medical community. So you come across a story that accuses them of being disingenuous. Are you possibly, let's say, not particularly objective in approaching this topic, since you're approaching it with what I perceive a bias and a point of view? And are you an accurate source of information then? Um, and should you be blacked out? <laughs> uh, I'm already blacked out. No, I'm serious. You've got uh, a bias. Let me answer your question, Charlie. In the first place, I'm not a source of information per se. I'm a translator. What I do is take a wheelbarrow full of paper that out. was written by people with Nobel Prizes. I translate it into a one-page, two-page cliff notes. It's not my information. It's not my opinion. See, uh, uh, this is one of the classic ways that people people refuse. It's not my newspaper. Hold on. It's not my TV station. But there's a quote here that um, I brought this book because it said it better than anything else. What's the name of the book? It's called Energy and War, Breaking the Nuclear Link. He wrote this in 1930, he said, in 1980, he said that the challenging of hallowed myths often excites intense emotions in persons who find those myths convenient or comforting. When you try to burst the bubble of a myth, a comfortable myth that somebody is living with, Oftentimes, they become emotional, they attack you personally, uh, say, oh, that's just your opinion. <laughs> uh, for the last five years, I've summarized the work of Nobel Prize winners, and people will come up here in rebuttal and say, well, that's Andy's opinion. Uh, I say, if you've got a, a problem with the information, contact the guy that got the Nobel Prize for writing the book. That's right. It's not my opinion. That's right. It's you know, it's not my opinion that there's 2,700 doctors that have been curing people of all the illnesses that have been misdiagnosed as age for the last 25 years. That's a fact. Now, we don't want to recognize it. Some do, some don't. 
It's a fact that buildings in New York were scattered over lower Manhattan as a cloud of dust. That's a fact that's not debatable. But some people, they're emotionally tied to the myth that America is the greatest on earth, and America was attacked out of the blue, so they can't handle it. They won't even lift their rose-colored glasses enough to take a look at the possibility that they've been living with a myth. You challenge people's myths, the longer they've been living with them, the harder it is to change sometimes. Tim Bolger. Tell us about the Scion rear latch and the solution. Is that a question? It is. It is a Scion rear latch. The Scion rear latch. Tim says, what is a Scion rear latch? It's an electromagnetic catch that you, you push a button, you reach under the handle and push a button, and an electromagnet just opens the door. There's no door here. So, uh, there's there's a fix for that too. Yeah, come see me later if you're having a problem with yours. Uh, I already have. I, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, Will has a question out here. Yeah. Any more questions? Let's go to rebuttals. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, uh, go ahead, James. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned a couple of times, and I saw I we both saw the speaker last week, so I'm not questioning the premise. But you mentioned about. Uh, these uh, furnaces and houses, you talked about all the suburbs, and I know I feel that's probably true because the speaker last week kind of uh, talked about that. But you didn't talk about any in Chicago. Well, is uh, there a reason for that? <laughs> no, the, well, the uh, the buildings that I'm uh, in Chicago. I don't, I don't physically know where they are in Chicago. I've seen a handful of articles. You're talking about houses without furnaces. Uh, houses without furnaces just simply have walls and windows that are so good that you need a tiny heating system. A big furnace is just obsolete. Like, uh, you know, upgrading from old 8-track tapes to a new DVD player. You still have music, but you don't have the old inefficient appliance. It's been replaced with something else. So there's, if you did a search, you could probably find affordable houses, you know, scattered through the city of Chicago too. Yeah, but it's been um, they've been relegated to the stories of a, a backyard inventor tinkering around with something, you know, nothing that concerns the mainstream. Or the, the rare articles that do get through are about people that you know, spend an extra half a million dollars to build a house with some solar panels and things, you know. So the the, the idea is it's not affordable for mainstream public. You know, but there there are, uh, you know, incidentally on that subject, uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota both have a code now where they, uh, any new house built has to have an air exchanger in there. The houses are tight like a thermos bottle. You have an air heat recovery ventilator unit. Heat and pump. If, if, not heat pumps. Heat recovery ventilator units bring in fresh air 24 hours a day and the old stale air is exhausted out. They're going to be uh, putting those things in the apartment soon. Now our suppliers are getting them. So there's a, there's a whole beneficial revolution coming on that, uh, but and, and, uh, and I forgot. Go ahead, Charlie. What, what were you going to say? Yes, Charlie. Okay, okay getting into his question. Now, Mother Earth news. I just got a whole stack of these from the 70s. There's been a whole green literature and a gazillion books and he published on energy conservation, even the government puts these out, Department of Energy, they give money for this, there's conventions and Union Navy beer, and you're claiming this topic is censored. How and where was it censored? Well, okay. I mean, we have Earth Day here. Yeah, well. Having speakers and I'm just... And I don't see where is where it's an important issue that should be given more attention, but is it in fact censored? If it wasn't censored, people would would have been building houses, affordable houses that cost the same, just like the houses in Schaumburg. If the if the two words no furnace were not censored out of the press, the copy press in Chicago, then we have ten times more homes today. They were built that way. And everybody that finds out about them, and they, they sell them as fast as they can. Um, look, do your own survey. You think it's not censored. 
talk, talk to people, talk to builders, ask them if they're familiar, if they have, ask them if they... That's not if my premise. You know, yeah, what I'm saying is, you can tell, if you find a city where everybody's using eight-track tapes, while the rest of the country went on a CD 20 years ago, you know there's censorship. If they don't honestly know that there's a new product like CDs for music, they're still using old 8-tracks, what would that tell you about the local media and television? If you could find a sports writer, if a sports writer stood up here and said, I've lived here in Chicago for 20 years, but I, I was a fan of the Bulls, but I never heard of Michael Jordan. Michael who? <laughs> uh, you know, the man's lying to us. It's just obviously lying to us. And, and this, this is, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that uh, media uh, uses to uh, bias and mold public opinion. But in, in the, the final, in answer to Bernie's question, uh, was it Bernie that asked about, do I have any bias toward the medical industry? Was that Bernie? Who, no. who asked that? You, Charlie did. Mm. No, I'm, I'm reporting what these other doctors are saying about the bias of our medical industrial complex in general. I don't, I think we have a lot of good doctors in America. You know, there's a lot of good hospitals. What I object to is using using the doctors in the good hospitals as a vehicle for extracting obscene amounts of money for people. The doctors in the hospitals are used as a conduit between us, our money, going through them up to the billionaires that run the HMOs. Or, you know, we, we, uh, we don't just pay a doctor anymore, we give a massive amount of money to a middleman in the form yes. of an insurance company or HBO, and then and some of the money dribbles out to the doctor. That's, right. That's the okay. system. That's what I'm biased against. Uh, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we operate here. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, you see some chairs up here. Uh, people who have something that they want to impart to the rest of us uh, have already, we have four uh, rebutters, uh, speakers uh, lined up here on those chairs, but they're musical chairs, and after they have spoken, uh, the next person comes, and we have some more chairs here uh, waiting for you. Uh, if you if you want to say something, I'd like to know how many people have something to uh, say to the rest of us. One, two, three, four. That's eight, nine. Uh, About five minutes, Brown. All right. We will allow at least at least five minutes. Ten all together. No, five. Uh, <laughs> 20 minutes apiece. You like to give money to CEOs. <laughs> he needs five to explain. Money for CEOs. Five minutes apiece. Yes, uh, if you can't say it in five minutes. All right, right, let's get started, bro. Thank you. Final questions. Final questions. One, one final, before anybody final uh, gets up and leaves, one final note. I have a handful of cards here with those portal websites on them. If anybody wants one. All right, let's take it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Frank. Frank, you don't. You don't know the truth, Frank. Okay. Uh, let's give the rebutters their due, please. It is no doubt that the system is corrupt. There is no doubt whatsoever. Uh, there is no doubt that the uh, banking system was, uh, was corrupted and was corrupted through many, many actions that they were taken by the same people that now are in the Obama administration in their, in their positions. Um, we, we have to change that. We have to change that. Uh, a thermonuclear device in a can under your bed, that's bullshit. That's, that's uh, <laughs> science fiction or something. Yeah. Um, so you have to know that Andy have many, many 
good points in his presentation, but he catches from here and from there and mixes reality with fiction. Uh, the AIDS situation in the world, that's one of Andy's fictions that the whole virus thing is a creation of the imagination of some conspiracy of some kind. That is bullshit. Uh, the NICE, Nuclear Energy Information Service, is studying a presentation, a series of films uh, that uh, they will be presented every week for a couple of months, and one of them is From Here to Eternity, Nuclear Waste Disposal is the theme, The Battle of Chernobyl, Fukushima Coupes, and, uh, and so on. So if you are interested, go to the NEIS website and you will find it. Uh, LEDs for industrial use, uh, even the people on the, uh, the plant that show us how they were using the LEDs, uh, I found out today that they removed them because they are not that efficient. So there is, there is uh, things that we cannot take it for granted on all these. Uh, alternative fuel, hydrogen is not going to be a fuel as a gas, that's bullshit. As a gas is not an efficient way to move a car. Hydrogen, in the other hand, is in the future. Hydrogen will be part of our energy solution, but only as an addition to methane gas and in a process to convert the methane gas into a liquid fuel. That is not done. It will take maybe 10, 15, 20 years to realize that, but it's in the works. And it will be the solution, or at least one of the solutions for the energy source. So become, because of known physical laws, no car of regular set and size, you know, regular size, will ever run, never will run 100 miles per one gallon of gasoline. That's bullshit. And if you believe that somebody's saying they are running the car, you should go and buy the car and then sue them for, for lying to you. Uh, the USA, uh, where they become very productive manufacturing goods and so on, needed markets in the exteriors. They couldn't sell everything to us inside. So then they, what followed is the gun, gunboat diplomacy. We were forcing people to buy our ship, and we were selling shitty steel steel for dice and tools, and there was fucking shit. But we were forcing on Latin American countries to, to buy that steel. Uh, and so that's how the steel industry fell in this country, because they, they, they had no incentive in, in reinvesting and, and applying the science that we discovered right here in this country how to make better steel. Uh, if you want to see something about read the, in the Great Depression of 1990, how the system of the military industrial complex and the gumbo diplomacy and so on works. Uh, you cannot nuke global warming. That's a theme that we are pushing. Nuclear is not a solution for global warming. It has many, many sides. Mountain top removal. That is a horrible thing that the corporations are doing, similar to fracking. They remove the top of the mountain, dumping everything on the rivers, and, the, and of course, these carry uh, mercury, sulfur, all the things into the river and lakes. It's, it's a very destructive in the environment. But the corporations undo it, inspire people protesting and destroying their lands and everything else. So we have to stop that. Uh, try uh, convince somebody of his, of his uh, wrong way. Try religion. Mosquitoes <coughs> with soul. That was the reason that this guy gave to believe that God exists. Because he was convinced that mosquitoes 
have sold. Yes. And he used quantum yeah. mechanics to prove that. <laughs> so, one of our speakers. And that was 30 years ago. I was in Huntington, Wisconsin, in a high school that had no furnace at all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mosquitoes do have souls. Yeah, mosquitoes do yeah. have yeah. That I couldn't yeah. take. I mean, yeah. That's too much. Francis <laughs> Trump. Frank still I'm a religious man, ago, and I, right? I'm a religious man, okay, and my reaction to the mosquito is still uh, swat I, I first and ask questions later. I wanted to start one way, but um, first of all, I have to address all the bullshit. <laughs> um, we have two people, those who believe what the speaker has said because of what he's read, and those who think that everything is the opposite, that it's bullshit. Well, I would think that the group that the speaker would fall in, which I think he did a great job, what he did was bring information. And it's up to us whether or not it's going to be bullshit or if we're going to accept it as true. And there's a large group of people who would start by saying, which is what I had here, is that you can't handle the truth. That was in the movie, wasn't it? Somebody was supposed yeah. to say. Oh, okay. good man. Jack Nicholson. Okay. Jack Nicholson, a few good men. You can't handle the truth. What? Because what we're talking about, what we have here, maybe 50 people, not even 50 people. If each of us took this out into our own individual areas, there would be those who would look at us and say we were crazy. You know, oh, you've been to the college, yeah, right. There are so many emotional ties connected to the truth. You have the proud uh, veteran, the ones who went to war and came home, the Marines. I have a few of those in my family. You have the dead veteran, the ones who died for this country. Those people have connections. They have families. They have people who love them. And the last thing they want to hear is that this is not a war. They died for nothing. They can't handle that, true or not. What are they going to do with that information? They're going to disregard it. You have the 9-11 survivors. You want to tell them that it was an inside job, that your son, daughter, mother, father was blown to bits because the president wanted to fight somebody he was mad at about his daddy or something. They don't want to hear that. They can't handle that. The AIDS situation, I have a nephew who died of AIDS. He was my sister's only child. I'm not going home and tell her that AIDS doesn't exist, that it was all a farce. She probably knows it, but she can't handle that truth. I can't read my writing. <laughs> okay, um, somebody mentioned about the speaker last week and him accepting a position as a CEO of a company, da 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 da, -da and paying him da 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 da. From what I heard of him, what he said, where he came from, and where he was going, it's not about the money. He wouldn't, I would hope from listening to him, he wouldn't even accept the job because he seemed to be trying to make things better, not to profit off of people who don't have. Might be wrong, but that's what it's saying. Um, somebody mentioned Michael Jordan and the money. Well, with the money Michael Jordan made, he was a wonderful guy when he made it. He got a great statue of him and um, what's the guy with the computer thing? Steve Jobs. Yeah, Steve Jobs. They're all wonderful people. But then after it's over, Steve is dead. Michael is no longer needing that money. And when his people got in a position where they needed his support in order to get a raise, he said, no way, don't give it to him. He can't accept the truth. He's now one of the 1%. He gives less than a oh. And Steve Jobs, we find out every day, he was an asshole. Yeah. You know, but he still did wonderful things. I mean, he gave <laughs> us wonderful things to work with, but he was still who he was. Barack Obama, why the United States needed a person, a picture of a person who was both black, white, and anything in between. I don't know, but they found one, they got him, 
<laughs> he doesn't run anything. The banks oh, run it. They always yeah. have, and we know that. That's right. Yeah, if he had did what he said he was going to do, he'd have been assassinated. They could not have a black man be assassinated as president of the United States. No doubt about it. Not for doing something to help the people. Now, if he jumps up and says something about those folks down south that he shouldn't say, they might kill him. You know, it's okay then. <laughs> but not for that. Just like Harold Washington couldn't die in the mayor's chair. We know he was dead when he was sitting in there, but they said he did at the hospital. He died sitting right there. They know it. They did it. Whatever. Okay. Someone, I thought quite rudely, kept asking the speaker for the solutions, because that was the wording in the paper we had. We all know the solutions. We all know everything he said here today. Nobody here is beyond going to the computer and looking at and finding what he's talking about. I am. I don't have a the, so, the solution, we all know what that is. And we all know we can't get enough people to come out like the 99%. I should be out there with them every time they're out there, but it's too cold. <laughs> and I get a retirement check, so, you know. <laughs> uh, come on. How can you get enough people together to take care of the solution that we know what it is? It needs to be on public radio. It needs to be taught in the schools. The kids need this information, but they're not going to get it. They got to get, oh, you're going to tell me about time as much as you've been stuttering up here? Okay. They got to get the student loans. I got mine, they got to get theirs. It's a money thing. Everything is about money. Right. As far as the speaker's concerned, somebody else says something about killing the messenger. It's not necessary. We don't need to do that. His last quote and what was said about the buildings and the energy, it won't happen. There are homes being built in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where I wanted to go when I retired. I said, I'm going to retire. I want to go somewhere where it's really cool and they're doing cool things and I don't have to da 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 da. You can't get through the building codes in Chicago to do any of those cool things. You try to build one of those homes that's in Aurora or wherever, can't do it. Building codes prevent it. It's all about the money. And it's all about the people who can handle the truth, the ones who can handle the truth, and taking it out to the young people. So hopefully, some of them will grasp it and want to do something with it. Because look at us. Everybody here is over 25. I am. Uh. <laughs> We're not going to do anything but talk. That's right. So let's take it to the young people. Everybody's over 25, and uh, a lot of people are uh, homeless too. Okay, they got my house. This here is an envelope that I received from the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation. Okay, this envelope to put it in front of you people tonight cost me approximately one million dollars and 10 years of my life I am now free this is signed by the director in Springfield that admits perjury tampering with evidence prosecutorial misconduct uh, about 20 conspiracy charges against me by the state of Illinois to eliminate alternative medicine in the state of Illinois. I've been practicing holistic medicine since 1998 when I graduated from reflexology school. Then I went on to myotherapy school. It's basically oxygenation school. There are 275 million Americans that don't have cancer and they will never get cancer because in 1930 Otto Warburg was awarded a Nobel Prize for the cause, cure, and prevention of cancer. It's called oxygen. Okay? 
when you meet your oxygen thresholds in your body, that's your hemoglobin and a chromatic rhythm, and your white blood cell count, you cannot get a disease, not AIDS, not a common cold, not cancer, not hypertension, not diabetes, not arthritis, not cholesterol poisoning, nothing. You will be bulletproof against every known disease to man by having this oxygen in your body. And how do you do it? You just take a deep breath. Now, I would venture a guess that no one in this room has cancer or is being treated for cancer. Okay? Anybody dream of being treated for cancer here? Raise your hand. That's because we're breathing. <laughs> Do you get it? Okay, so here we have, just what uh, Annie's talking about, a total medical scam out here called cancer, AIDS, uh, arthritis, hypertension, My mother died. whatever the, the medical system wants you to have, they have this dartboard, and they just close their eyes, they throw that dart, and it says, oh, multiple sclerosis. Well, how easy is it to get multiple sclerosis? I'll help you. Very easy. If you're a diet pop freak, you will get multiple sclerosis. My sister had, for about, uh, about four, well, no, it was many years she had it, but then she was diagnosed with it at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And she cried a, a cry from hell. I've never heard anybody cry like this. These white coats came in with their $100 bills tucked in their little pockets and said, Ms. Whitworth, you have multiple sclerosis. We found the scarring on your brain. We found it on your uh, spine. You have multiple sclerosis. My brother was sitting on one side of her. I was sitting on the other, and she started sobbing. Now, she's a very intelligent gal. She uh, is extremely talented in IT. In, in product management and getting projects on time. Okay? She couldn't work. She was falling over. She was 150 pounds overweight. And all three of my sisters were gorgeous in high school. They were all on the homecoming float. They were candy stripers. Okay? And here she is, 20 years later, 150 pounds overweight from diet pop. Wow. And uh, a sugar habit too. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts, things like that. Okay. and spending a lot of time in airports getting these projects back online. So what did she do? She researched the medications that they wanted to give her for multiple sclerosis. The leading adverse reactions were depression and suicide. Now she's intelligent. She says, I don't think so, Doc. I'm not going to take that stuff. I said, okay, go ahead with your life. She couldn't stop drinking that diet pop. The second year after that diagnosis, she started shooting up interferon, okay? Two years later, she stopped the diet pop. The last seven years, she hasn't had a trace, not a bubble, not a pimple of multiple sclerosis. It is gone. It is completely gone. She's lost about 100 pounds, okay? And she's multiple sclerosis free. I had fibromyalgia for 23 years after a motorcycle accident. I was lied to by the doctors. They said there's no cause and no cure for this syndrome. It's gone. It's never coming back because fibromyalgia is oxygen deprivation. I've got a lot of oxygen in my body. Okay? I've got a, a pulse oximeter that proves it every day. You put it on your finger and it gives you a reading of your oxygen and your pulse. Okay? These are all scams, folks. And this proves it right here. I'm free, and I'm telling you right now, every one of you, every last one of you, that if you start understanding from your uh, internet and so on how to put the oxygen in your body, you can bulletproof yourself. And I'll have some more on this another time when I stop by here. I get by here when I can, and it's good to see all of you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is it on your website, Zach? No, man. No. I would mention that oxygen is a free radical, and it has been shown in many studies that free radicals are one of the things from which 
cancer cells grow, they actually emit their own type of oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, which uh, attacks the lipid membranes of the adjoining cells and uh, causes apoptosis, the death of the cells. The uh, death of that cell then provides the nutrients for the cancer cell, and thus they grow in the presence of oxygen. <clears throat> um, a few notes on uh, the physics of uh, entropy. Uh, every device that we use, every single device is uh, consumes energy. The, the, our cell phones, um, the radios, the TV, the microwave ovens, and so forth, uh, to say nothing of the fossil fuels that we use. It produce, they all produce waste heat, and we can use a little bit of the waste heat in recycling, as Andy has mentioned. But nonetheless, the waste heat that's produced uh, is going to increase the temperature of the Earth over a period of time, maybe two or three centuries, but not that yeah, way. Um, again, on Andy's uh, comments on the electric car, um, in the January 31st issue of the uh, New Scientist, the British Journal, in the technology section, they uh, wrote an article about a lithium air battery, lithium and air. And uh, there are four national labs that are working on it at the present time, including Argonne Laboratory out here in, uh, in Southwest Side. Uh, their calculations show that a lithium battery, a lithium air battery would be able to drive an automobile for about 500 miles without recharge, then you charge it up again. It takes about maybe 40, 45 minutes to recharge it. And um, that's all about lithium batteries. Uh, the military industrial complex and the uh, situation in Europe vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the United States military. Uh, NATO was formed after World War II uh, by the, it's called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And the purpose of that treaty was twofold. Number one, they wanted to drive the Soviet Union back to its its own borders, thus freeing uh, uh, Eastern Europe from the so-called communist uh, menace. But the second and most important aspect of NATO was the the military forces in Europe to would be used to suppress revolts but not in one's own country. If you had a revolt in Hungary, you didn't use Hungarian soldiers, you brought in Norwegian soldiers who didn't speak the language but knew what to do, shoot the people. Uh, so, so that NATO's purpose was to suppress anticipated revolts after World War II. And you can look this up in the, uh, in, in the files. Well, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. That's the fourth principle of the Unitarian Universalist. You don't have, we don't have to accept that, but most do. But listen to that. A free and responsible search. You may never find the truth. So my view is you better be, always be skeptical, a little skeptical of everything you hear, including Andy's presentation, which was very interesting and very good. But uh, I don't accept everything you said. Uh, talking about uh, TV and uh, DV uh, DVDs, uh, granted, most people get their information from TV. Almost totally useless. I used to get cable for free. Then they, uh, my building quit doing that, and they said, you've got to pay 80 bucks. 80 uh -huh. bucks for this junk? Uh, I do pay to get a uh, good reception, so if I want to watch channel 11 or 20, uh, I can watch those. That cost me 29 bucks just to get connected. But most of the stuff on most of the channels is uh, totally useless. And the same with the radio. There are a few good radio stations I occasionally listen to. Or when come here to the College of Complexes or go to the library. But the TV itself is, is pretty bad. Uh, the military, yeah, I agree. We ought to do away with most of our military is totally useless. Why do we need 11 aircraft carriers? I don't think my time's up yet. Uh, why do we need eight or 900 bases? This is baloney. 
Uh, the Unitarians had a, a talk on peace last fall. This guy who was uh, an Iraq veteran said he wondered why we had a standing army. A standing army? Uh, why did we go into Africa? On and on. Yeah, I question most of it. I think we just got to cut back so much. It's such a waste. And, they, and unfortunately, I believe a lot of the guys and gals that we sent over uh, died uh, totally in vain. It's terrible. Uh, but, you know, there are other ways to do it. We just got to cut back, and I think it can be done. Uh, pr uh, predicting disasters like Andy does is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, just imagine if uh, Paul Revere said, the British are coming, the British are coming, the British are coming. That was what, 1775? Suppose they didn't come till 1812, say. Uh, we wouldn't hear much about Paul Revere. Uh, in other words, you've got, uh, predicting disasters is very, very difficult. I'll give you three <coughs> examples uh, that have some truth in them, but still. The end of suburbia, I've got that DVD. Is suburbia ending yet? Uh, I think not. There are a lot of suburbs around, and I think Andy lives in them. <coughs> so I think uh, the end of suburbia hasn't come yet. Uh, another one was uh, the end of oil. Well, there's plenty of oil, and, and Andy and others have pointed out that they can find more ways to make oil, even if it'll destroy our whole environment. So that's another one. There, I have one more. Let's see, the end of oil. Oh, the population bomb. Well, it's true, we got too much population. But, I mean, before it's a total disaster, I think the population bomb was written, what, 20, 30 years ago? Yeah. 40. 40? Okay. Uh, it shows you how far out of date I am. But, uh, granted, in some countries it's absolutely terrible, and if you get down to uh, even my church tomorrow morning, I'll have trouble walking uh, in Lakeview. But, I don't think the population bomb has ruined us totally. So it's very difficult to predict disasters like Andy is trying to do. So it might be that he might be early on a few disasters. Thank you. Tim Boulder. Okay, Andy. I like, you know, one thing about Andy is he is very convinced about his viewpoints and he's very you know and I'm sure given the amount of research that he's done he could probably give us a lot of, of good no more information on those topics I would like to think that I'm getting to be a little bit more the same way and Andy is right about one thing there are a lot of solutions out there now, I know you guys do not like nuclear power. Right. But there is another type of reactor out there that's not been well known enough. Oh, oh, oh boy. This may be the thorium reactor. I yeah. just looked yeah. into it. <laughs> and they, you know, we've heard that before. Probably. I, you know, and that's one possible solution for, you know, not the energy problem, because I kind of agree with what. The New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman says, what types of energy are we going to need? All of them. That includes wind. That includes solar. That includes newer and cheaper sources of oil. And over time, we know oil will be running out. And according to T. Boone Pickens, natural gas might be a perfect good rich fuel until we start coming up with like, things like hydrogen or, or the electricity in a hydrogen fuel cell or other types of solutions, but they are out there. Uh, for the medical community, you know, it's amazing the other day when I walked into the Veterans Administration to do something to sign up for benefits. Yes, I'm the vet. All I had to do was give my Social Security number and fill out a simple form, and I was signed up. And you know something else? When I went from various medical appointments, 
That history was able to follow me from terminal to terminal without a lot of paperwork. My appointments and everything else are all online through a simple system called MyVAHealth.net, and it's been totally modernized. And I was able to do things like see a dietitian, uh, get a little help on, you know, quitting smoking, for example. Uh, a lot of solutions to it, and a lot of the bureaucracy that I had normally encountered even as early, early as 10 years ago seemed to be eliminated by just having a good, solid information system on medical records. And they seem to do a little bit better efficiently. That is part of what you see in the solutions. And, and like many of you have seen, just the internet alone has made so many changes to the, to the world today, you know, just with the access to truth. I am still amazed to this day about how I can go on my computer and, and you know, pull in the, Isra the IBA, the Israeli Broadcast Network, Al Jazeera.net online. And one site that Andy, I am sure, failed to mention is one called TED.com, which is Technology, Education, and Design. And it's been a, what the TED conference is, is a solution. They bring together a lot of the CEOs and great thinkers of the world for a three-day conference where they each get 22 minutes to present solutions to problems. And boy, some of these speeches will absolutely knock your socks off. You go there on any given day, and type in almost any topic, you will see things from the revolutions to bird watching to, you know, things about, you know, a, a new security strategy for the Pentagon to some incredibly great music that these people are doing with electronics or to even things like seeing Tony Blair talk about why socialism is going to work. Of just a ton of solution sites and solutions to problems. And so much so that TED has now started doing something called TEDx conferences where other people in other fields can join this site and move through. And it's all available through a web browser. Uh, what really besperks me though, even today, revolution and dictatorships has gone even better. There's a small, there's a small little institute called the Albert Einstein Institute headed by a guy by the name of Gene Sharp. And what he does is he talks about how to bring down a dictator. It's an old lesson. It's withdraw the consent of the people. He's got about 130 ways that he can do it. And it's been proven to work because the laboratory was the Balkans bringing down Milosevic. And he's now been the methodology that's brought around the Arab Spring. Solution is yes, Andy. We needed, though, a little more information about those solutions. Thank you. First of all, I would like to say that I'm amazed, Tim, that as a committed capitalist, you would cite Tony Blair and socialism as a solution. Um, I find this actually curiously refreshing. Um, with regard to Andy's comments, and I'm not going to here get into a debate as to which of his material I liked, I liked some of it, which I disagreed with. I've been through this before at other times at which Andy has spoken. Most of you already are familiar with the objections that I could make. But I will say this. Um, Andy was very quick when he was up here to say that it's not his material that he often condenses, that it's the material of the people uh, whose work he is condensing. And he draws an analogy between himself and Cliff's notes. I think a better analogy to what Andy, Andy does is Reader's Digest. And just as Reader's Digest is to take the a responsibility for the material that they condense, and granted their political point of view is quite a bit different from Andy's, but nevertheless Andy also has to take a certain responsibility for the material that he condenses, simply because he chooses particular items to condense. Same with the Reader's Digest. Uh, with regard to the military-industrial complex, on that score I essentially agree with Andy and other speakers, except to say the following. First of all, it's been with us for a long time. President Eisenhower did not for nothing warn us 
when he left office and delivered his farewell address on January 19, 19, 1961, in his televised farewell speech in which he warned us, quote, of the dangers, whether sought or unsought, of the acquisition of power by a military industrial complex. And this has been going on ever since, and gaining power ever since. With regard to the comment that was made about we should abolish our standing army, well, I agree that we should be more careful about how it is deployed and about how various uh, weapon systems and other supplies that the military needs uh, are selected and that there is some cutting back that can be done. But the idea of abolishing the standing armed forces is horseshit, plain and simple. You might just as well abolish the police and fire departments and say, well, we'll never have a fire, or we'll never have crime. Horse hockey. We need the military for the same reason we need cops in the fire department. Thank you. Thanks to Major World War in 50 years. Ex Americana. <laughs> Not quite to that extent. <laughs> That's where you carry it to the next <laughs> okay. Now, read the Bible, please. Yeah. Where can we get? Uh, HIV AIDS. What do you mean? I am personally convinced that a lot of people have died of HIV AIDS and that it's not a fiction, although there are misdiagnoses and there are probably quite a few misdiagnoses and the uh, cures for AIDS, the various cocktails and pills, um, may have amongst them uh, some uh, lethal uh, components. Uh, they're, they're not all vitamin pills, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, aside from that, energy uh, conservation and uh, the, the uh, use of new uh, resources of all sorts, uh, technology, uh, will probably help a, a, a great deal in uh, reducing A, global warming, and B, uh, the uh, cost of energy. Uh, and that, of course, is very alarming uh, to the the various energy producing uh, industries that exist. Uh, coal power, uh, you know, the United States has lots of coal. Uh, and, and it's uh, uh, relatively ex uh, cheaper to produce than, than some other uh, resources. But it is expensive. It has been very expensive in lives. Uh, mining is not a, uh, a, a, a harmless uh, enterprise. Uh, whether it's uh, the uh, pollution uh, that comes from uh, removing mountaintops or uh, the pollution of of the uh, sulfur and particulate matter uh, that uh, spread over the uh, south side of Chicago, and for that matter, the rest of uh, the nation. Uh, the, uh, so, in the couple of minutes I have left, uh, <laughs> what can I tell you? I, I just read an article in the Christian Science Monitor on uh, uh, why gasoline and oil uh, prices uh, should fall. Uh, that was last week's issue of the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, 
That doesn't seem to be happening, however. <laughs> Uh, the uh, this price seems to be going up. There are all sorts of good reasons why that price should be going <coughs> uh, And uh, the the Gulf uh, of the, uh, the, the Strait of Hormuz in the, uh, the Persian Gulf uh, <coughs> is. Uh, the threat, uh, if, if that were to be closed either by the United States and uh, the Arabs, uh, it would raise the price of oil very significantly worldwide. Uh, I have about 24 seconds left. Uh, I want to thank Andrew for his first talk. Uh, uh, I'm sure that he and Doc Woodhurt uh, uh, would like uh, our, our medical system to go away, but it does uh, do us a, a whole lot of good as well as a whole lot of harm. Well, geez, uh, as usual, there's so much to uh, rebut Andy on, it's hard to know where to start. But first of all, I want to make a quick comment that. about John Adel. <laughs> yeah, John Adel, uh, you know, he's, he's one of these guys that's motivated by, you know, this internal motivation of accomplishing things and doing good and all that. But I was just using him as an example of, that, of saying that that's the, you know, a person of his caliber is what corporations are are looking for when you can find a guy like that with those managerial skills to put these humongous projects together and follow them through to completion. You know, I mean, he, he did the uh, bubbly dynamics, that's done. Now he's starting this next thing, and he's got a really good start on that. And he, you look at a guy that can take these huge projects like this, basically out of nothing, with a vision, start and put together. That's the kind of guy you want running your company. If you've got six or seven billion or 40 billion in capital market capitalization assets you've got hundreds of thousands of employees in multiple countries you want a guy like john adel to be at the helm steering that that's a big boat to steer and that's why these guys are making millions of dollars you know, like they pay they pay uh, michael jordan millions and all these other guys rock stars and people make millions of dollars i mean but here it's it's voluntary so what I you know I have got no problem with it. It neither uh, uh, breaks my leg nor picks my pocket. So I, mean, I don't care. It's voluntary. And like I said, if I was in the position of these big companies on the board of directors, yeah. I would sure want a person, you know, that could yes. with those manage that managerial yeah. skill set and, and supply and demand. And uh, it's hard to find guys like John Adler's. You know, I only know like one guy like I'm 50 some years old. I only know, you know, personally. Well, I know a few a few guys. But that probably that kind of talent. I know another guy in Indiana that runs I'm talking about living oh, people that no, I know and associate. Like, uh, I know a guy I know the I know the guy that owns Task Force Tips in Indiana. It's a company that makes fire engine nozzles. Uh, but uh, you know, th these guys are really few and far between. So anyway, that's that. Uh, quickly, uh, about the 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 war thing, these these guys in, in Iraq and Iran, or Iraq and Afghanistan, did not die in vain. I mean, they were there for a reason. You know, Islamofascism is a threat. We were attacked by Al Qaeda. Afghanistan was putting them up, and uh, we did go in there and we we got rid of Al Qaeda, and we got rid of the Taliban for at least for a while, and we did finally get uh, Bin Laden. Uh, so that's part. And if you look at a map, you'll see that our, our we have these military bases in Iraq and in Saudi Arabia, and they're surrounding Iran. And there's a reason for that, and that's because, you know, we've been in, at war with Iran since, since 1979, since the hostage situation. It's been a co kind of this covert war. Iran is the, is the funding and the idea, ideology behind Hamas and uh, Hezbollah, you know, the, the bombing in Beirut that killed the Marines, that was an Iran job. Uh, you know, they're behind a lot of these problems. They're developing nuclear weapons. Talk about nuts, you know, wackos. There's guys with one foot in the 7th century 
and a finger on an atomic button. Uh, so we really have to, you know, keep get, grab this Iran tiger by the tail. Uh, so there's good reason for us to be there. There's good reason for us to be in Iraq. I really have those bases there to, to cover Iran, but like I, I, I did all this research for my speech a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, one thing we want to do is try to influence the budding revolutionary movement in Iran to overthrow the mullahs and come, you know, come back and join the rest of the world in, you know, modern economics and free market economics and democracy. Look well, by having, by having I Iraq being a neighbor of theirs, and if we can get a good, you know, free market, modern democratic system going over there, that'll be a heavy influence on Iran, and hopefully the uh, the revolutionaries there will they'll, they'll overthrow them from within, and we won't have to have a shooting war with Iran, because they it's, it's a huge country, they have a huge army, they have big trouble. So this is a, this is strategy, you know, it's not published, it's not that it's censored, it's just like, this is our, more or less our plans, and you can, if you dig deep enough and read enough books, this will come together for you, but it's not something they go out and publish widely because you don't give your enemy uh, you know a, a map and a flashlight and keys to the safe you know but that's what's going on uh, so that's that and so none of this was was in, in vain uh, just like uh, the Cold War that went from uh, you know 1945 to 1989 and included these little uh, theaters like Vietnam and uh, and then uh, what? Afghanistan and Korea, these were all, you know, these were all just little stages in the Cold War. It was us and Russia duking it out through these, it was, it was, we were duking it out through these, through these little, uh, uh, proxy wars. You know, I mean, that, I mean, Vietnam, I mean, I mean, Russia was funding, you know, North Vietnamese. Oh, we, we were bleeding, we, we bled a lot of dough out of Russia by fighting in Vietnam. But anyway, uh, You're insane. What? That was all part of the Cold War. That was all his stupid Cold War. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was us and Russia fighting, having proxy wars. It's just like, just like the proxy war, you know, going on between, uh, you know, in the, in the Middle East between like us, us and Iran through all these, you know, secondary channels and things. Um, Andy mentioned that uh, that nobody that nobody believes that. Uh, that Oswald shot Kennedy anymore. Well, that's blatantly false. There was a whole documentary made called Oswald's Ghost, where they picked apart all these conspiracy theories. Yes, and you know, sometimes what's hard to do with these conspiracy theorists is, it, you know, sometimes people just can't accept truth. Like somebody said, you can't, can't handle the truth. Well, they just can't. People just can't accept that the president of the most powerful country in the world could get gunned down by a lone kook. But that's what happened. That's when you right. examine the facts, <laughs> that's what happened. I wish I could go on more. I have, I have the major solution for most of our problems, and I don't have time to get drunk. Oh, can we oh. oh. the second round? Oh. 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 Okay. Oh, I got solution. It's all good. Thank you very much. How about it? It's okay. Uh, well, thanks for the reminder about the whole bar. It reminds me now we have a right wing radio, and they are constantly. Scaring you about the economy, get you to buy gold. So it's the gold war now. Yeah. All right. Now, yeah. Uh, next, thing I wanted to bring up. Uh, you know that there is. Uh, I, I don't want to dispute any of the good points that were brought up so far. Just uh, throw in a couple more solutions. That uh, God sent me arthritis to cure me of junk food and pop overdose and all that. So uh, it, it's better now. So in the course of that, uh, I got interested in walk sticks. Now, uh, I don't know what kind of uh, machine they got, but you know, maybe an expensive machine to twist this wood around. But um, the way this one works is it drills some little holes and you run the hard wire through and in a kind of like a D shape here. And then you wrap the soft wire around so it's a nice grip. And so this is known as the Georg Friedrich Memorial D handle. <laughs> and so uh, notice this is just some. Ordinary tree harvested from the uh, creative the reuse warehouse of the uh, resource center at 135th and Indiana Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Frank Little Sonny Scott Jr. varnished this. He's a co-inventor of that. He's 84 years old now, by the way. 
Uh, so that I just would mention that you need to know that by mid-century there's going to be hundreds of millions of persons over the age of 100, and they're all going to need a walk stick. <laughs> and uh, there's a Hummocker Schlenner catalog currently advertising a walk stick for $59.95. And you're not going to spend so much time making these. You're going to make some decent money. Uh, just a tip. All right, now, uh, what was another thing? The population bomb. There is a population bomb, and the answer is birth control for beef cattle. Did you know there's 1.2 billion beef cattle on the planet, and they eat more than all the humans put together? And you want to eat all that red meat and get heart disease and cancer? Oh, well, I had a right, so that's that's a no-brainer. <laughs> you know, let them die off by attrition. Well, wait a second. Now I'm I can remember one of the other ones I wrote down. Let's <laughs> see how we're doing. Okay, uh, right, now I was I've been uh, kind of interested in this matter of energy too, and it's this home heating is a terrible ripoff. Now, what that's caused by is the average person in the average family are so shy and so scared of strangers, they don't make friends with somebody in Buenos Aires or somewhere. And then in the summer, you got tree houses in your, in your yard or whatever, and there's a family from down there living up here, you know, May to October or whatever, and the kids, everybody lives up in the trees. The housing that we have today, we consider homes, that's really warehouses. We'll live outdoors, and then we'll go <laughs> south for the uh, northern winter. There'll be a skeleton staff of 200,000 in Chicago in the winter to take care of all the buildings and everything, right? Yeah. See, and, that, and the, all these old ships, like they're tearing up in, uh, you you probably know, in, uh, what's the name, Gujarat. There are some cities there where they tear up all these old ships for scrap metal. That'll be banned. And these old ships that can travel only two miles an hour, yeah. they'll be used to transport Billions of population south and north every half year. My name for this is Hemigration <laughs> to the other hemisphere. <laughs> little kids till age 10 will never live in a winter climate with all this padding and clothes and breathing that dry air and buildings and all that inhibition and stultification and can't learn anything. So uh, that's uh, sort of like the other thing. The average kid will know 10 languages by age five. I want to finish now with International Music Scores Library Project. If you want to learn how to multitask, the clear, obvious thing is listen to music and read the score at the same time. Here you've got it exhibited on paper, two-dimensional or whatever, and it exactly coincides with the music that you're hearing, wow. and you go on there and listen to Johannes Brahms. You're like, Johannes Brahms! <laughs> and then, just as you think it's going to be in E-flat major, it turns, Johannes Brahms! It tells you it's going to be in C minor. Okay, <laughs> so like that's, that has taught me a hell of a lot, and I would just add that having lived abroad in foreign countries in a foreign language, this is good for the best thing ever happened to me in my life. So it's never too late, even if you're 74, you ought to spend a year or two living in a foreign language. Somewhere. Thank you much. Oh, by the way, if you want to discuss this with me, Maxwood, like in Maxwell Street, Maxwood at cabled.org. Okay, what a speech. Give congrats to the man there, Mr. Tyner. You know, it brings, uh, rings a lot of bells when a guy like this comes on because I've known him since I was this tall. Uh, my dad used to come to this place. you got to excuse my inexperience for speaking here, you know, but i got to start somewhere with these uh, solutions, I guess, that need to be addressed and dealt with. Okay, first of all, you know, I'm not going to go in any order, but I think the, the, the first to the, the decide the solutions, you got to define the problem and accept the problem and then come up with a plan to, to fix it. And that, as the lady, you know, over here, the gentleman, the lady said that, you know, nobody wants to deal with the real issues. You know, I mean, so, so the issue is first getting people aware that, hey, this is what's going on. And when you look at a guy like Tyner, his resources are, are meager, but he makes the best out of them. And I think the problem is everybody you're looking at in this society in general. 
I mean, it's all the overconsumption. I need this. I need that. I need a faster car. I need a nicer this. I need a nice, you know. And then you got the rich. Oh, I need a boat. I need you know the limo. I need you know everything else. And 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 then when it, it goes down the list, and you got the greedy politicians cutting the deals on the side. Well, I need more power. So I mean, you got to take each problem and then start breaking it down into small segments. You know, if you start with the politicians, you get all the money out of the politicians. There's no more elections. It's a it's a jury duty system. You got a certain qualification, boom. You're qualified, you get on the list, you're randomly picked, you go serve, and you get the hell out of here. Next up. Okay? But you know, there's there's other solutions and every these guys getting impatient back here. But uh Africa has an epidemic of AIDS. I'm sorry, that's a rebuttal on the gentleman's uh, speech here. Okay? And you gotta go there and check it out or look on the line, you'll figure that one out. But uh you know, there's a lot of things to cover here. You know, you got to look at the local, state, federal, and start digging in on these. On, you know, and I, I didn't like what the lady said about everybody here is just talking and there's no solutions and no one's going to really do anything. I, I hope that a uh, newer generation of this complex starts a new complex that actually gets things going a little bit more with it all. You know, so I guess I'm going to leave it there because I know you guys are pressed. How much more time I got, boss? Uh, two minutes. Two minutes? Oh, I could have left on with that. Okay, let's see. Uh, so like I said, I'm new with this. You know, i got to start somewhere. Let me look at my notes real quick here. Let's make sure I didn't miss anything pertinent. I mean, the bottom line is that, you know, look at the recycling program in the city alone. It, it's, it's ludicrous. You know, they're not doing jack jiddly about it, you know? I mean, everybody needs to, to do more about that. That's less energy right there. You know, you know, it's just everybody's got to start conserving, and then our prices of gas would go down. If you carpool, you know, everybody get together, go on on Craigslist, and the guy's going to this location, give the guy a ride. Get, have him give you five bucks for gas. You just save money. I mean, so there's a lot of solutions on the ground level. You know, even like Tyner comes up with his little inventions, and you know, it's it's got logic to it. You know, you got a man that lives on a certain amount of money. You wouldn't believe the story, is you know, of this guy how he's doing it. I mean, a millionaire could live that way for a year and see how, and it, was he going to be any happier or any, any less happier? I don't think so. So I think, you know, you know, Obama, you know, if you get into Obama, the guy went up there, they told him the reality, you know, he's a pitch man, you know, he can't deliver what he wanted to, it, it was a big dream, he, he was a, a hell of a speech man. I mean, if you've seen the last nation, the, his last speech, I mean, the guy, you know, he's a you know, golden tooth mouth, I mean, you know, but that's, he, he doesn't have the balls or he doesn't want to get killed to get the job done, you know, I shook the guy's hand, it's a little mushy, you know, and you know, you got Rom, you know, Rom, Rom's a, you know, you, you got it, I'm glad Bailey's out of it, I have to say, you know, I didn't break the bottle of wine, but I didn't really like the guy, okay, based on his, but Rom, I don't know yet, the church, church ain't out yet on Rom, but the dude's working hard, and we're, we're going to have to put some pressure on him to get things done, so, you know. That's about all I got to say, and uh, thanks for uh, spending the time with you guys. Yeah. All right, let's just thank our speaker again. I just got 30 seconds here. Uh, listen, be cautious about CEOs of multinational corporations who tell you they're entitled because they have a, they're entitled to all kinds of money because they have attributes that you are lacking. <laughs> That's gibberish. That's absolute nonsense. Uh, you have a little problem here, my friend. There still are 50,000, 55,000 books published every year. Claims of censorship are difficult, if at best at all. Uh, Tim, I don't ever want to hear this, that the internet facilitates the dissemination of truth. I put up websites, I can go home and an hour from now put up a website which an incredible number of people will, will look at and believe that says the moon is made of green cheese. That does not facilitate the dissemination of truth. And last of all, too, since you said my speaker, and he has heard over and over there is no hate, sir, there is no such thing as fibromyalgia. <laughs> yes, and if there's no AIDS, there's no fibromyalgia, right? Right, so hold on, I got as much, you got your experts, and I've got mine. Thank you. <laughs>
Charlie Crew experts on the Champion. Let's let Andy rebut. Until 11 o'clock, Andy. We got five, six minutes anyway, and this will be quick. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for coming. I would especially like to thank a handful of people here who will remain nameless for giving the rest of us a graphic demonstration of people that can't handle the truth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will remain nameless. Yeah, Jack, Jack Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with uh, the lady over here. What is your first name again? Dorothy. 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 Dorothy is absolutely on the money when she says that troops uh, fighting over there, families that are supposedly fighting for freedom, they don't want to hear that their son or daughter, like Pat Tillman, died of friendly fire or died in a screwed up uh, accident on a roadside bomb. Uh, you know, they, they don't want to hear that their patriotic sons and daughters enlisted thinking they were going to defend America and something else is going on. It's a big, big shock. And uh, one of the mothers that did face the reality was Cindy Sheehan. And she's famous for writing about it. And she just got a new book out. I just saw it last night. I haven't even got a copy of it yet. But she went to Venezuela and interviewed, uh, you know, Cesar Chavez, is it? Hugo, I'm sorry, Hugo, yeah, my mind's a little, not Caesar, but Caesar, he's famous for uh, uh, growers, right? Way back, that's 30, 40 years ago, isn't it? 40 years ago. 40 years ago, yeah. But, um, and now it, knowledge moves forward through a population and a concept known as uh, the Galileo curve, Galileo learning curve. It named after him because he was famous for getting arrested for publishing the truth that the Earth is not the center of the universe, it revolves around the Sun. And it took a while, but people came along behind him with telescopes and said, hey, he was right. And some took the Catholic Church 300 and some odd years to issue an official apology for persecuting Galileo for publishing the absolute scientific truth that we all work with now. So when you're early on the curve, when, uh, like these books that I brought tonight, a lot of these people were very early on summarizing a massive amount of scientifically solid data on the subjects that they're working with. And the general public doesn't want to handle uh, or face the truth. Some people, like there, there was a, 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 an article written years ago talking about people that are falling, to, there's a bell curve. And some people are on the early end of the curve, most people are in the middle, and there's some people here. And they, they talked about Germany. They said there are some people that would get involved and oppose Hitler's program for exterminating the Jews. They would get involved just on the early information that such a thing might even be possible. Then a lot of other people in the middle of the curve, they were slower to get involved, but as the evidence got more and more solid, an underground developed, and they tried to save some lives. And then there's actual Jewish people that wouldn't protest as they were being pushed into the gas chambers. They're on, they're on the other, the very far end of that spectrum where the, you know, the, the evidence is so overwhelming and they're still not protesting, right? And my point is, at some point, evidence, I, the, one of the examples I use is the Catholic Church congregation problem. If you announce in, in any kind of Catholic church uh, on a Sunday that kindly old Father O'Malley has been molesting your kids for 27 years, <laughs> half the congregation says, you're slandering that poor man. We, we don't want to hear it. Get the hell out of here. They attack the messenger, right? Mm -hmm. The other half, although, say, if this is true, we have to do something about it. We can't just talk about it. We have to do something. And that's where we are today. And so... Uh, I made a resolution this year that when, when anybody, uh, we, we have people in this country that are so far out of touch with the reality on certain issues where they're in touch with reality on others. Uh, they give a talk on uh, 
you know, something that they're really familiar with and it's been proven and everything, they sound absolutely normal and in touch with what's going on. But they'll stand up here at a podium and say that all of these doctors that have been curing people of the misdiagnosis of AIDS, that that's all a myth. That, you know, uh, I, I understand that a lot of people, if you've lived over, if you're over 60 years old, you know somebody who knows somebody that supposedly died of AIDS. Because 300,000 people in a period of 10 years in this country died of AIDS. But our system was much more, um, you know, America was harder hit than a lot of the other European countries because they have universal health care. And they didn't keep people on toxic medicines long enough to finish them off. If, if, if a patient was obviously being poisoned, the doctor would say, well, that's not working, let's try somebody else. Some, somebody, something else. So the European countries were, uh, they reacted much sooner in learning that uh, the, main, the main AIDS medicine, AZT, was simply rat poison for humans, and that's why people were dying. And they, uh, they reacted, you know, the French doctor that co-discovered, he actually discovered HIV, the French doctor, Frank, Frank, uh, hey, uh, Charlie, Charlie, Frank, this is for you. The French doctor that got the Nobel Prize I'm nameless. for, for yeah. Yeah. I'm nameless, I think. <laughs> the, 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 the French doctor that was given the credit for discovering HIV as a cause of AIDS, the probable cause, has been saying at conferences worldwide since 1990 that HIV is not the cause of AIDS. Other things are making people sick. What they're calling AIDS is a rundown immune system. I don't deny that there is AIDS. I never said that. People slander me because they don't want to face the reality that a whole bunch of people got sick, a whole bunch of people had run-down immune systems, and a whole bunch of people were intentionally poisoned by the American pharmaceutical industry to make billions of dollars and finish off as many gay and minorities as fast as possible. That's what was done. That's the reality. And that, that is not debatable. That's bullshit. But you have people that say that's bullshit because this is how you slow down the dissemination of truth. If there's 900 scientists on one side and there's one or two people that don't want to face the reality, then you have a debate with one person from each side. Like we had a, supposedly a debate on 9-11 here a couple months ago. We had me on one side promoting, uh, the, the, presenting the facts that are peer-reviewed all over the world, and you had a man stand up here and lie to you for 35 minutes. I've got the tape. I, you know, the, the CDs. That man came in here and just put out bald-faced lies that would have been laughed out of any high school physics class if a junior in high school, a physics teacher, would have said, get your sorry ass out of here and down to the principal's office for disrupting the class. <laughs> so a, a debate on something is where you have two, you can have two genuine sides. The answer is not no. We don't, we don't have a debate in class uh, be, you know, when we're teaching our kids if, if the earth is round, if it revolves around the sun. You don't have people from the Flat Earth Society come into science classes and debate with the teacher and say, well, there's two sides to every issue, just like they're debating creation versus evolution. There's always two sides. Uh, well, I, I advise, if anybody uh, can afford to take a trip for one day, drive down to Cincinnati and go three miles across the border, uh, Ohio River, and visit the Creation Museum. You can see uh, exhibits of young dinosaurs with humans riding them as ponies from 6,000 years ago. This is a war on young minds and scientific thought in this country. If you can convince anybody that humans and dinosaurs coexisted and everything was created 6,000 years ago, then that's a mind that Bertrand Russell called that studying and distorting the minds of the young in what is called education. Young people, five, six, eight, ten years old, haven't lived long enough to defend their minds. And so they're, they're inundated with a huge amount of cr criminally insane bullshit by our corporate media. And so you can still use, in meetings like this, you still have people that stand up here and say, we were attacked by Al-Qaeda on 
when the rest of the world knows that that opinion is total bullshit. And it's time to say it. I, I, will, I will not tolerate anybody standing up telling me that, my, uh, that, that this body of evidence is my opinion. I've summarized a bunch of stuff written by people with Nobel Prizes. And the body of knowledge, it, once it gets big enough, it's no longer debatable. And, and we move forward on it. And we, we have to, give me another minute, uh, we have to find some compassionate way to help our less, uh, less forward-thinking friends uh, move into, you know, reality. You know, you know, if you have a big seg segment of the population living with illusions, uh, that's that's not good for society at all, and that that's where we are today. So, um, thank you all for your suggestions. Uh, uh, the last thing I would suggest, probably one of the best history books, one of the very best history books that talks about a lot of different kinds of things and what corporate America has been up to, where we are and where we headed, is this single book, AIDS, Opium, Diamonds, and Empire. It's not just about AIDS and the medical community, it's about you know, the whole history of the military industrial complex in the United States. Thank you all for coming.